Yes, Mr. Hard. Commissioner, the next witness is Ms. Perkovich. Uh, Ms. Perkovich, uh, can I ask whether you uh, want to take an oath or would you prefer to make an affirmation? An oath, thank you, Commissioner. I'm standing then while the oath's administered. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give that the evidence that I shall give will be the truth will be the truth the whole truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and nothing but the truth. Yes, thank you, Ms. Perkovich. Do sit down. Yes, Ms. Perkovich, could you please tell the commissioner your full name? Uh, Mary Ann Perkovich. And your business address is 201 Sussex Street, Sydney. And your occupation? I am the executive general manager of Commonwealth Private and Commonwealth Bank. And are you here in answer to a summons I issued am. by the... And do you have a copy of that summons before you? I do. I tender that summons, Commissioner. Exhibit 2.72, summons to Ms Perkovic. We don't have the summons. I think uh, it's coming, we... yes. Thank you. Can I just explain, Ms Perkovic, it's for your... Uh, uh, protection so that uh, there's no doubt that you're here under compulsion and that all the uh, consequences that attach under the Act are there, they're engaged. It's not just some uh, mindless uh, ritual I'm going through. So Exhibit 2.72 will be the summons to Ms Perkovic. Ms Perkovic, have you made a statement in answer to rubric 2.1? Yes, I have. And is that statement dated 3 April 2018? Sorry. Yes. And I understand you have some corrections to that statement? I do. Is the first correction at paragraph 119? Yes, it is. And could you please tell the Commissioner what that correction is? The last sentence, uh, the word I, could you please replace that with Miss Maria Lycouris? And could you please spell Lycouris? L-Y-K-O-U-R-A-S. And would you mind please making that correction yep. and initialling the margin? Yes. And Ms Perkovic, is the next correction to paragraph 120? Yes. And would you please tell the Commissioner what that correction is? So in the fifth, uh, about the fifth line, there's some words in brackets there. If we could replace that with approximately 10,000 as at May 2012. And would you mind again please making that change in your handwriting yep. and initialling it in the margin? And having made those corrections, is that statement true and correct? Yes, it is. Commissioner, I tender the statement of Ms Perkovic dated 3 April 2018 together with its exhibits. Exhibit 2.73, statement of Ms Perkovic, 3 April 18, and exhibits. Ms Perkovic, have you made a supplementary statement in answer to rubric 2.1? Yes, I have. Is that supplementary statement dated 4 April 2018? Okay. I'm just trying to locate it. I think it might be in that folder, so no. Well, I don't think the witness now got it. Uh, sorry. Is that statement... Sorry, I'll go back a step. Do you have before you a supplementary witness statement dated 4 April 2018? Yes. Are the contents of that witness statement true and correct? Yes. Commissioner, I tender that supplementary statement. Its doc ID is cba.9000. Double zero two one dot triple zero one.
Exhibit 2.74 will be supplementary statement of Ms Perkovic for April 18, CBA 9000-0021-0001. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Ms Perkovic, have you made a statement dated 3 April 2018 in answer to rubric 2.2? I have, yes. Uh, are the contents of that witness statement true and correct? Yes. Commissioner, I tender that witness statement together with its exhibits, its doc ID is CBA.9000.0007.0001. Exhibit 2.75 will be further statement of Ms Perkovic, 3 April 18, uh, CBA 9000-007-0001. Ms Perkovic, in answer also to rubric 2.2, have you made a supplementary witness statement dated 4 April 2018? Yes, I have. Is the contents of that witness statement true and correct? It is. Commissioner, I tender that witness statement. Its doc ID is CBA.9000.0022.0001. Further statement of Ms Perkovic, 4 April 18, CBA 9000.0022.0001 and exhibit, exhibit 2.76. Thank you, Commissioner. Ms Perkovic, in answer to rubric 2.5, have you made a witness statement dated 3 April 2018? Yes, I have. Are the contents of that witness statement true and correct? Yes, it is. Commissioner, I tender that witness statement. Its doc ID is CBA.9000.0005.0001. Exhibit 2.77 is further statement of Ms Perkovic, 3 April 18, CBA 9000-005-001. Ms Perkovic, in answer to rubric 2.17, have you made a witness statement dated 9 April 2018? Yes, I have. And I understand there is one correction that you wish to make to that statement? Yes. Is that correction to paragraph 58, subparagraph B? Yes, it is. And would you please tell the Commissioner what that change is? Okay. Um, on the, one, two, three, on the fifth, uh, fifth line, there's a date there that says the 2nd of September 2013. I'd like to change that to the 23rd of April 2013. And with that correction... Perhaps if you'd make it yes. first and initial it. I'm sorry, Commissioner. Ms Perkovic, you have made that correction and initialed it? Yes, I have. And having done so, is the content of, your, of that statement true and correct? Yes, it is. Commissioner, I tender that statement and its exhibits. The doc ID is CBA.9000.0012.0001. Exhibit 2.78, further statement of Ms Perkovic, 9 April 18. CBA 9000-0012-0001. And finally, Ms Perkovic, have you made a witness statement in answer to rubric 2.24, dated yes, 5 April 2018? Yes, I have. The contents of that witness statement true and correct? Yes, it is. Commissioner, I tender that witness statement and its exhibits. Its doc ID is CBA.9000.0009.0001. Exhibit 2.79, further statement of Ms Perkovic, 5 April 18, and exhibits CBA 9000-009-001. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Mr Hodge. Thank you, Commissioner. Ms Perkovic, you're the Executive General Manager and a Director of Commonwealth Private Limited? Uh, I'm, um, I am, yes, thanks. And you sit, or that section sits within the Business and Private Banking Division of the Commonwealth Bank of Australia? Yes. And you've been put forward by the Commonwealth Bank to give evidence about two issues. One is what's been described as fees for no service. Yes. And you've also been put forward to answer some of the questions that the Commission asked with respect to platform fees. Yes. Now, with respect to the fees for no service issue, as it arose for Commonwealth Bank entities, there were two types of fees for no service issues that arose with respect to 
those entities? Uh, depending on which entity. So with Commonwealth Financial Planning, um, there were three issues that arose. All right, but why don't you summarise in your view for Commonwealth Financial Planning what the three issues were? Okay. Uh, so for Commonwealth Financial Planning, um, the three issues were firstly, um, there was a um, there was actually an overcharging of uh, OGS or ongoing service fees. We found that and remediated that. The second um, issue was actually in relation to what we call orphan clients. These clients are clients that actually aren't al allocated to a financial planner. And um, we found occasions where <laughs> advisors weren't allocated in appropriate time to actually uh, deliver the ongoing service. And uh, the third instance was um, where delivery of the service was not provided or we couldn't find record of that delivery. And with respect to, so that was Commonwealth Financial Planning. Yes. With respect to BWFA, that's Bank West Financial Advice. Correct, yes. Which of those three issues applied to that entity? Okay. Um, with respect to that entity, it was the orphan issue where we found a few um, cases of that and then the delivery of no service based on advisors not delivering the service that they uh, needed to uh, or there was no documentation of that service. And then with respect to count, which of the issues applied to count? Okay, so with respect to count, uh, count is a separate issue in relation to clients um, that were, uh, that well, in relation to advisors that actually had left count, those uh, clients uh, didn't go along or didn't leave the business with count. And um, count actually applied a fee to provide some service to those clients. So it wasn't an ongoing service fee, uh, it was a separate fee. So that was a kind of a third or separate issue to the other two. It was also an orphan client issue, wasn't it? It was an orphan client, but um, a different orphan client issue to the one in Commonwealth Financial Planning. I see. And to date, see, or I'm sorry, not to date, as at the 31st of December 2017, the Commonwealth Bank of Australia had paid out approximately, or offered approximately $118.5 million of refunds, including interest, to customers who'd been victims of these issues. Uh, we did. We paid uh, compensation to clients um, uh, across the different issues. And has there been further compensation paid or offered since the 31st of December 2017? Uh, the only offers, um, sorry, uh, across the different entities, there is a provision. Uh, this relates to clients that we can't contact or that we're still trying to contact. Is even now, today, is the Commonwealth Bank still trying to identify all the clients that might have been victims of these issues? Uh, we're not ident we have already identified those clients. What we are waiting for is just some confirmation to be able to make some payments. There are only a small amount, um, about 98% of the payments have already been made. All right, and the relevant period to which those payments apply is from July 2007 to June 2015? Uh, uh, correct for uh, for Commonwealth Financial Planning and for BWFA, and um, in my witness statement for count uh, uh, is a different date. All right. Well, we can come to that. Yeah. And I want to just make sure we've understood correctly the structure of how all of this fits together. Commonwealth Financial Planning is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. Yes, yep. And it holds its own Australian Financial Services licence. Yes. And Count, which was previously a publicly listed entity, is now a wholly owned subsidiary of CBA? Uh, Count is, yes. And it was acquired by CBA in 2011? Correct. And you had worked at Count for some period of time before its acquisition? I was, yes. Were you still working at Count up until the point when it was acquired? No, I left Count in 2009 and okay. joined CBA in 2010. And how long had you worked for Count before then? Uh, so I started in Count in 1998, so period of 11 and a half years. And so when you came over from Count over to CBA, 
were you already familiar with the practice of count in relation to dealing with clients where the advisor had left the count network? Yes. Okay. So you were aware of what it was that count did? Yes. And just explain to the commissioner what was it that you understood that they did? Okay. Um, that is at the time when you left count. At the time that I left count? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so we were solving for an issue um, which was that um, the way that count operates, and I think if I just give a bit more context to, to give you the answer. So count operates as a franchised um, model. Count has the licence and the account businesses are self-employed, uh, predominantly accounting-based uh, firms. Uh, some of the products that they use, um, and this predominantly is, uh, is actually wrap accounts, they need to, you need an advisor to be attached to those clients for the client to transact. Now, when a client, um, when an advisor left the account practice, uh, we had a process um, which we wanted the, the, advi the account client to absolutely know that the advisor was leaving um, the account licensee and uh, that their, the advice that they were providing was no longer under the account licence. So each, uh, that meant that um, each advisor needed to um, send authorisations to the product providers to change the dealer group because in actual fact they were going to another licensee. Now, what actually occurred, and this um, kind of issue really stemmed when we bought on the BT Wrap account, uh, that is attached to an advisor servicing that client. Now, we send out a letter to the client um, when, they're, when, when the firm leaves the licensee to go on a, to another licensee. The advisor's process is then to transfer the clients across to their new licensee and new product provider. It's up to the client to decide actually whether they go with the advisor or not. And um, Count has no ability to reallocate the clients or send them to another advisor if they choose not to travel with their, with their current advisor. So after a three month period, um, we you know, are left with some clients that for whatever reason, by their choice, have not left with the advisor. It's usually a small amount of clients because in the count business they are accountants and uh, usually they have the relationship as an accounting based relationship with their clients. So if they decide not to go, um, count as the head office actually does not provide financial um, advice. And, however, these clients needed access to some of these products for transactions. So what we did do was actually charge a fee uh, to transact on their behalf if they wanted access or transactions to, to that. That orphan issue is very different to actually what is in Commonwealth financial planning. And by nature, it is very client directed. Um, there is transparency. And once a client decides not to leave with their advisor, Count uh, sends a letter to that client to explain that there is no ongoing service relationship. And in actual fact, if they need access to their products, which um, they can't do because at that time um, that um, there was no access directly to those products that they could ring Count Head Office and we would facilitate transactions for them. So in actual fact, we were operating like a client service function for them, for them to have access to these products because they couldn't access them directly. Let's break down a few parts of that. You referred to a problem that arose with respect to the BT RAP platform. Uh, so this problem, um, yeah, uh, so what I was explaining is um, when, uh, with the BT RAP platform. Maybe if I just yes. walk us through okay. this. Sometime before 2009 when you left, yes. Count made the BT RAP platform available to financial advisors acting under the Count licence. Correct, Is that yeah. right? And under the BT platform, an advisor service fee would be automatically deducted. Yes and it will be remitted to count as the licensee? Uh, in 2009, no. Uh, the count advisor um, actually put the advisor services fee on the platform and that was remitted by the product provider directly to the advisor. I see. That and changed. It did change in 2013 where it came to count. I see. And when the advisor left count, 
how was it then, as at 2009, that Count continued to receive payments with respect to that client? Okay. So the payment that Count received, um, and there are multiple product providers, but I think if we just use that um, the BT product as an example, Count would communicate to the client that um, the advisor has left, that um, there is no ongoing service relationship, because with the advisor kind of leaving, they would have left that BT platform that we had. Um, and in place, Count would charge a fee to, um, which is a, a obviously a lower fee, not to provide ongoing service, but to actually be able to give the client um, access to um, you know, their platforms that they couldn't at that time ordinarily access directly with the product provider. And you referred before to Count's three-month rule? Yes. So what was Count's three-month rule? The three months um, that we went through this process was actually to give them time to transition their clients across into their new licensee and to the new plat platform provider. And who received the advisor fees during the first three months? Uh, so the advisor fees that any advisor charged for ongoing service would go directly to the advisor. I see. And would the advisor continue to repay any of that amount to count? Uh, through that period, depending on when the client left, because they obviously left throughout the period, um, if the client was charged, was, if the client was still in the product, uh, up until the day the client left the product, there would have been like a fee that Count would have received as part of uh, the arrangement. And how does Count receive, or how did Count receive that fee? Uh, so that was off the back of um, a fee that um, we had, which was the administration fee within the platform. So there's two different fees. So every client had an administration fee. Some clients were on ongoing service relationships, and where they were on, on ser ongoing service relationships, the advisor at that time would put it onto the BT platform, and um, and then they would remit that directly to the advisor. So for that, I think we might uh, perhaps take it up uh, after lunch. Thank you, Commissioner Mr. Hodge. In Two p.m. Yes, Mr. Hyde. Thank you, Commissioner. Ms. Perkovic, just before the break, we were talking about an issue that had arisen whilst you were at Count before you left to come to CBA. You recall that? Uh, we spoke about a process that we had. Um, the actual issue was discovered when I came later into, into CBA. So what we were describing was actually the process um, that we had at Count when we dealt with clients who actually did not want to go with their, or chose not to go with their advisor, and how we gave them access to their products. I understand. What you were aware of at the time that you left Count was that where a client's advisor left the Count business and the client didn't go with that advisor, that after a period of three months, the client would be allocated to Count head office. Is that right? Yes, when the client chose not to go with the advisor, the client stayed with head office, but not under an ongoing service arrangement. And that's what you knew about as at the time that you left Count in 2009? Correct. And what was supposed to happen in that circumstance was that the fees would be dialed down, is that right? Uh, so yes, it was a different combination because it was a few different products, um, but the fees, yeah, ongoing service fees, um, obviously left with the advisor, they were not anything to do with count. Um, in its place was what was called an administration fee, um, and that fee uh, was actually where, for the service of actually transacting. It was, so that's just a distinction, and I know it's important to explain because it is very different uh, to the other orphan issue. Was it for the same amount as the service fee? No. It was a different amount? Yeah, it was a lower amount. I see. Because there was no ongoing service provided. And was the administration service provided? Uh, no. Uh, depend oh, sorry, I'll just correct that. It depended on which product the client uh, was at. So 
if it was a wrap account, um, the way that wrap accounts operate is, um, you know, those, those clients would stay within the wrap account. They would get an administration fee, uh, but any dial up or dial down of fee just depended on the different products. Uh, so master trusts were very different to wrap accounts. Did Count Head Office provide administration services to orphan clients in relation to wrap accounts? Uh, the Count, um, yeah, so if a client rang, uh, sorry, if a Count client contacted Head Office and they wanted to do transactions on their account, the Count Head Office would transact for that client. Were there other account, I'm sorry, were there other products other than wrap accounts where the Head Office was unable to transact for the client? Sorry, unable or...? Would not provide any transaction service or administration service for the okay. client. Uh, outside of the wrap accounts, the master trusts, the clients, uh, like, could contact the services, but if they actually, um, yeah, wanted some information around that, then they would contact head office as the advisor of their relationship, but not on an ongoing service basis. As I said, it's more like a client service is how we intended the system to... the service to operate. All right, well, let's, we'll return to that in due course. Now, CBA had also had ownership of another AFSL license or holder, which was BW Financial Advice Limited. We did, yes. And that, the BW there stands for Bank West? Correct. And CBA acquired BWFA when it acquired Bank West in 2008? That's right. And BWFA ceased operations in October of 2016? Yes. And there are some other entities within CBA in addition to the three we've spoken about, which is CFPL, BWFA and COUNT that provide financial advice through employees or authorised representatives? Uh, no, there's another, sorry, there is another financial wisdom, which is through self-employed authorised representatives. All right, and you haven't been asked to give a statement with respect to financial no. wisdom. Okay. Now, the vast majority of CFPL's financial advisors are employed by an entity within the CBA group? Correct, yep. And that entity is Colonial Services Proprietary Limited? Uh, the, yeah, the employment contracts um, are generally that, that, that provider. There are some additional different contracts, but depending on when people started, that, that's the majority of people are in that contract, yes. And those employed advisors work typically in a CBA branch? They do, yep. I said typically. Is it typically or in fact is it universally they work in a CBA branch? Uh, so uh, they would be, they'd have access to the branch in some cases, uh, depending, uh, basically the branch, um, if they can't locate the, locate the advisor actually in the branch, then their office might be near the branch, but uh, they would generally see clients within the branch. Uh, we also have a phone base and a video conferencing service, um, and so they're located at, at head office. And there's also some financial planners that are self-employed and act as authorised representatives for CFPL? Correct, and that business unit's called Pathways. And it appears from your statement that the number of employed financial advisors employed by CFPL has decreased since 2008? It has. And is that part of a conscious decision to reduce the size of the financial planning workforce? Uh, it's not. Um, I would say that uh, through the transformation of when I came into the business in 2012, uh, we have been very focused on recruiting the right people within the business. Uh, um, obviously, we um, had actually, from a cultural perspective, had terminated uh, advisors through the course of that. And on, in 2015, um, we introduced new education standards for advisors. So we, um, it was harder to recruit um, you know, different types of people that uh, were very much focused on having people in the business that had an advice-based culture. As a result of that, it um, takes us longer to find planners um, of the right culture and fit that we want in the business now. And uh, so we don't have a conscious decision to reduce, 
but it is based on finding the right people to be employed in our business. Can we bring up Ms Perkovic's statement, which is the supplementary witness statement to rubric 2-1. The doc ID is CBA.9000.0021.0001. This is a supplementary statement to which you've, of yours, which has already been tendered, Ms Perkovic, and this yes. was in response to some supplementary questions that the Commission asked to establish the number of clients of yes. financial advisors. Can we go to page two of that document? Thank you. And if we just blow up the table in the top half of the page. we see the, the fourth column from the left is total number of clients of employed financial advisors, and it has increased since the end of December 2008 until the end of last year from 105,988 clients to 191,830 clients. Do you agree? Yes. And as we understand it, that number is in each case comprised of three types of, or three classes of client. The first is clients who are signed up to any ongoing service package for any calendar year. Yes. The second is clients who paid commission in any calendar year. Yes. The third is clients who received advice from a co Commonwealth financial planner, financial advisor or pathways authorised representative, including one-off advice provided in any calendar year. Yes, there's a separate column, I think, for the authorised representatives that relates to... That's right. The column yeah. on the, the column on the right-hand side applies just for authorised representatives, yep. and that would be just the pathways, the pathways authorised representatives. Correct. Yep. And if we take the number as at 31 December 2017 of 191,830 clients, mm -hmm. do you know what proportion of those clients are clients that were signed up to an ongoing service package for any calendar year? Uh, so it's about 20% of clients. Um, so, uh, so we generally had, um, so it was about 20,000, sorry, it was about 20,000 uh, OGS clients um, that uh, we had at any one time. That obviously increased as the population uh, was increasing. <coughs> well, if it was... So 10%, sorry, yes. About 10% is ongoing yeah. service clients, is that right? So back in, in... In 2017, yeah. All right. So in December 2008, you think it would have only been about 10,000 clients that had ongoing service arrangements? Um, yes, off the top of my head, yes. And... Of the balance then, so let's take the year ending 31 December 2017, about 20,000 then are clients who are on ongoing service packages? Roughly, yes, those numbers, yeah. And how many of the balance are clients who are receiving one-off advice? Well, the rest, yeah, the rest of the clients would um, either be clients that have received one-off advice at any particular time. Well, presumably it's only one-off advice in that year, isn't it? If they receive one-off advice in the year 2008, you're not counting them as a client in 2017, are you? Oh, sorry, I'll just, yes. So what, what um, yeah, maybe just rephrase that. So what are you, can you just ask your question again, please? Yes. Of the 191,000 or so, you think yeah. about 10% are ongoing service clients, so about 19 or 20,000. Of the balance then of about 170,000, how many of those clients are clients that received one-off advice in that year? Okay, I don't know that number. Okay. Do you know how many are clients in respect of whom commission is paid? No. Can I 
show you a document which is CBA.0001.0095.0334. So you see, this is an appendix to a response by Commonwealth Financial Planning to a notice of direction under Section 912 Capital C of the Corporations Act. Yes. And it asks for the total number of ongoing service package customers in each of the financial years, financial year 11, financial year 12, financial year 13, and financial year 14. And then you see there's a table in the bottom third of the page. Can we just blow up that table? And that seems to suggest that there were somewhat consistently in the period 1 July 2010 to 30 June 2014, about 20,000 clients receiving on ongoing service contracts. Does that sound right? Yes, I know the number to be about 20,000, but it varied from year to year. All right, so but was it about 20,000 every year? Um, well, I know this notice that we produced, and we did actually, um, off the back of getting that number, was once we had got Deloitte to help us determine the exact number of clients. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's, that would be the numbers that we, we, we have. All right, and that's obviously ends as at 30 June 2014. Does the number of ongoing service clients remain constant? That is about 20,000 each year. I don't know the exact number, um, but certainly it was, yeah, it's roughly around that, that number. Okay, roughly around 20,000 yep. each year. And I might just tender that document, Commissioner. Exhibit 2.80 will be response to uh, notice of direction or appendix one uh, response to notice of direction CBA 0001 0095 334. Thank you. Now, if we bring back up the statement that we were looking at, which is CBA.9000.0021.0001, and go again to the second page. Let me just clarify a few other things about this. You see that the number of clients for the year ending 31 December 2013 is said to be 164,000 clients. Yes. Now that number continues to increase through to the end of 2017. Would that increase include any clients who were paying, additional clients paying commission to Commonwealth Financial Planning? Okay. Um, can I just clarify, when you talk about commission, are you talking about grandfathered arrangements or are you talking about ongoing service fees or initial advice revenue? Well, your statement says in paragraph six, the total number of clients in the fourth and fifth columns in the table above comprise clients that, and then subparagraph B, paid commissions yes. in any calendar year. And then you explain where the relevant fee or commission was paid out of a CFS product or in the case of the total number in the third column above, a fee or commission paid in respect of a common shore policy. Right, yes, okay. So that's what you meant. Yep. So what I want to understand is, is it possible that that increase from 164,000 to 191,000 included an increase in the number of clients paying commission? Okay. 
The way that fees, um, so before, obviously pre-FOFA, there was commission that was paid on, uh, on, on um, that clients paid commission with. Uh, after FOFA, it's an advice services fee, so it's kind of a different uh, fee, and that's yeah, and then the actually ongoing service fees are on top of that. So commission, um, yeah, would be that we would earn revenue for that for those clients across that. As to the breakup of kind of all of those payments, I'm unaware of, but it would be us looking at our systems. So it is whatever revenue. Commonwealth Financial Planning was earning and it was in the form of different payments. I think we might be at cross purposes, Ms Perkovic. Yep. As you've noted, from the introduction of FOFA, it wasn't possible to receive Correct. commissions in respect of new clients. Yes. It was possible to continue to receive grandfathered commissions Correct, in yep. respect of existing clients. Correct. Yep. And there are some products, though, that FOFA doesn't apply to, like life insurance. Yes. And CommonSure offers life insurance. Yes. Is it possible that some of this increase in the number of clients from 31 December 2013 to 31 December 2017 includes clients that CFPL has signed up to CommonSure life insurance policies? Okay. Um, I don't think the increase is just because of... No, uh, no, I yes. understand. I'm just asking, yes, is any is, part yes. of it? Yes, insurance commissions would be included in that. Okay. And so what appears to have happened is that from the end of 2008 until the end of 2017, the total number of clients has almost doubled. Do you agree with that? Yep. And at least from 31 December 2013, new clients wouldn't have been paying commission on investment products. That's right. So the new clients after 31 December 2013 must be confined to A, clients who are on ongoing service packages, B, clients who are receiving one-off financial advice, and C, clients who are being signed up to insurance policies that are outside of the FOFA regime. Do you agree? That's right, yeah. And during that same time period, from the end of 2008 until the end of 2017, the number of employed advisors has fallen from 733 to 582. Yes. And that's a drop of, what, about 25% in the mm -hmm. number of advisors, do you agree? Yep. So the number of clients has increased by 100%. The number of advisors has decreased by about 25%. You see? Yep. Is there a concern within CFPL about what this means for the ability of any of those employed financial advisors to actually service those clients? Um, because the, yes, um, just, okay, the, just, just your numbers now. The actual way that um, service and advice is provided in our, through through that period um, and systems that we have in place have changed. So while, yes, the number of advisors has decreased um, and we have in increased the number of clients coming through, it is not really a strategic move to, to do any of that. It's basically that, um, you know, we are servicing ongoing service arrangements with clients and we're also um, using other methods to service some clients as well like telephone based and video conferencing which makes it a bit more efficient. I'm not sure you're answering my question yep. Ms Perkovic. What I'm asking or the question I asked was is there a concern within CFPL about what this means for the ability of those employed financial advisors to actually service those clients? Uh, because we, um, sorry, the reason that I'm just thinking through this is because as the years, as we get through the transformation um, and do work through the business, there are other measures that we have 
ensure to we, uh, that we actually help the advisors and ensure that their ongoing service arrangements are being met. So for example, what wouldn't happen earlier, in, um, but now happens, is advisors that have large ongoing service books uh, get higher supervision and monitoring and also get um, kind of assistance with the servicing planner through that book. So what we have got better at um, and what we focus on is ensuring the number of clients that advisors have that they can actually meet the obligations that they need for an ongoing service arrangements for, that, for the clients that they actually um, have. Uh, and that is basically going in the, the later years because obviously we know the issues that we had in the business before. I'm still not sure that you've answered my question, Ms Perkovic. Let's break it down a little bit more. You understand, as a starting proposition, you have less financial advisors now than you did in, at the end yep. of 2008, about 25% yep. less. You agree? Yes. You have about 100% more clients. Yep. You agree? Yeah. Which means 25% less advisors have to service 100% more clients. You see that? Yes, I see on the mathematics, yep. But it... This isn't the first time you've considered that change, have you? Is it? No. Is it? All right, you've thought about the fact that you have less advisors and more clients. Yes. And you've thought about how it is that you can meet the servicing obligations to those clients. Yes. And you're aware that a specific issue that's been raised by ASIC is a concern that financial planning entities have been taking on too many clients for the number of advisors that they have? Okay, well the concern, yeah, the concern of ASIC um, is on the supervision and monitoring and fulfilling obligations. Yeah. Perhaps I'll ask that question again. You're aware that a specific concern raised by ASIC in report 499 yep. is about financial planning entities having taken on too many clients for the number of financial planners that they have? Yes. All right. And is that a concern that you personally have had to consider in terms of the management of the financial planning business? Uh, well, well, we have, um, but we have actually implemented different controls to ensure that that service <coughs> is delivered. In, yes. D does that mean You've, you're saying you've changed your systems so that each advisor needs to do less per client than they needed to do 10 years ago? Uh, no, we have improved. Um, we, uh, sorry, if I just take it through, because I know uh, there's different transformation that's happened through the business. So if you're asking me, am I, how am I confident that the advisors are meeting their ongoing service obligations, it is because through um, the transformation of the business and particularly post um, the, the, the issue with OGS, we have additional controls that we have put in that ensure those obligations are being met by the planners. I can't, I'm sorry, Ms Perkovic, I just can't tell whether you're deliberately not answering my question. The yeah. question that I asked was uh, concerned with the fact that the number of clients that you have has risen by 100% and the number of advisors that you have has fallen by 25%. Yeah. And my question is, is it a matter of concern for you how it is that that smaller number of advisors can meet all of their commitments to that greater number of clients? Uh, yeah, so in CFPL, um, uh, so importantly, the actual licensee helps and assist the planners with their with um, the the work that they do. So thing, so the so we actually have things like a power planning service um, that actually assist the advisors to do their work. Um, we also have had some efficiencies in them in their ability to to do their reviews. So. There are, you know, I think there is always, um, you know, work that we ensure that we're meeting our obligations and it's not just us focusing on adding more clients. We would put more financial advisors on. There's no, there's actually no reason at all for us not to put on more financial planners other than now we're very strict on what types of planners and people that we bring into the business. So the business then ensures that the right obligations are being met to the clients, um, but it might not always just be 
you know, service through the planners. They have support that they can actually call on uh, in, with head office, head office systems. Right, so I've heard, I think, picking things out of your answer, three things that you've identified to attempt to explain how you can deal with this increased number of clients with fewer planners. The first thing is power planners, is yes. that right? And the second, and we'll come back to that in a moment, the second is increased efficiencies. Yes. And the third is support from head office. Correct, yeah. Before we go through each of those, is there anything else that you want to identify as a reason why you are apparently unconcerned by the 100% increase in the number of clients as compared with the 25% decrease in the number of advisors? I don't think so at this stage. All right, so let's take power planners first. What yeah. is a power planner? Okay, so a power planner works with the financial, uh, well, the power planning team helps assist financial planners put together a statement of advice. Were there no power planners in 2008? There was a smaller team of power planners in 2008. I see. So in 2008, it would be necessary for the financial advisor to put together their own statement of advice for the client. They still had, a, they had, a power, they had power planning services, but they were very small. I see. There were fewer yeah. power planners that they could rely upon. Correct, yeah. And now CBA has increased the number of power planners that it has. Yeah, through that period. And I assume a power planner is cheaper for CBA than a financial planner. Uh, I don't know their salaries, but it, it, um, the remuneration would be a different structure because they're not, revenue, they're, they're not looking at clients or revenue generating. And, the incre and what I understand you to be saying is that now, rather than particular work being undertaken by the financial advisor, it is instead being undertaken by the power planner. Correct. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's not a matter of concern for CBA? No, I think it's great that um, an individual client comes in and uh, there's more than one person that reviews the advice and helps in assisting the advice. So they work very closely together. A power planner doesn't need to have the same qualifications as a financial advisor? Uh, at CBA, the power planners um, we actually have the power plans to have the same qualifications, which is degree qualified uh, and our G146, as we do with supervision and, mon mon uh, and people that supervise and monitor. So they're not, they're not authorised, so they're not authorised to give advice, but they do uh, need to work with the advisor and understand the advice process. Right, the power planner is not authorised to give advice? No. They have not achieved whatever is necessary in order to be authorised to give advice? Uh, power planners still go through the training, the same training that a planner does at CPA with the, with the induction. And so why don't they get authorised to give advice? Uh, because they, their, well, their job role is to actually complete the, help the advisors complete the SOAs. So these are people that um, work with the planners, but um, they're not people that, that actually um, yeah, give, give advice directly to clients. And then the second gain was in relation to efficiencies? Yes. So can you explain what that means? Okay. Um, so efficiencies in systems that we have. Um, we also, um, with respect to financial planners, when they go through the advice process, um, we help them, or well, well, the advice process and the documentation um, we, we work through systems that can help them uh, work, through, work through kind of their issues um, and also um, yes yeah, so when yeah so but basic um, so sorry because I'm just working through and I think the confusion is while the number of advisors are reducing, we actually have support staff at head office that is increasing. And that's where the difference is in actually helping the obligations in, um, in actually servicing and looking after our clients. I'm sorry, I'm not sure if we're <laughs> now blending from your second reason to your third reason yeah. for being unconcerned. <laughs> the second reason was efficiencies. The third reason is assistance from head office. Correct. You've offered 
an explanation as to what you mean by efficiencies. I'm not sure, frankly, what it means. Okay. Do you want so to try with, again? Yeah. So with the, with the efficiency part, um, over the years, um, we have worked, um, we've worked to actually have um, systems in place where we can track, um, you know, the advice process better. Uh, financial planners can, um, can, can draw on a team to help with the, particularly people with ongoing service, that can help uh, with actually looking and monitoring investments that clients have. So there's a lot of, yeah, uh, and I'm blending the two because probably the efficiencies are both at a head office level and also at a planner level. But I would say, a, you know, a client coming into a planner in 2008 <laughs> versus 2017, the experience would be different and planners would have a lot more resources available to them uh, to fulfil their obligations and go through the advice process. So there's no question um, that, you know, advice is still, um, you know, a very uh, paper-based system, but through, you know, through systems and processes that uh, we've implemented across that period, um, we have just been able to help monitor and, and, um, and help advisors with their, with their obligations. When you say if you come in face to face, the experience must be different. The most obvious way it must be, it must be different is that it must be much shorter. It can be shorter, depending on what the advice the person is getting. Well, it has to be. You had 25% more people yep. 10 years ago dealing face to face with half the number of people. Now you have twice the number of people and 20, twice the number of clients and 25% less people seeing them. Yeah, the length of, sorry, the length of the time doesn't, uh, the length of the time that a planner spends with their, with their client depends on the circumstances of that client and, you know, an advisor's obligations in going through the financial needs analysed and also through the statement of advice. Can we go to the third reason you offered, which is head office support? Can you explain what you mean has changed in relation to head office support? Okay. Um, so in with respect to head office support, we have teams that help with the monitoring of investments. Um, we also have teams that, um, that, that help with particularly, for example, if a client cannot or an advisor cannot uh, do an ongoing service obligation or meeting, then we have phone-based and video conferencing teams that the advisors can actually use as well for that, for that process. Um, and think better education and training as well. Can I just clarify, when you talk about having advisors who can do phone-based yes. and video conferencing, those advisors are included in this count of the number of employed financial advisors, correct? That's right, yeah. So was it the case that going back 10 years ago, there wasn't a head office function where there were employed financial advisors? Correct. So in fact, this table is not deliberately, but slightly misleading because what we should understand is that 10 years ago, there were 733 financial planners that were effectively out in the field, is Correct, that right? Yeah. And now it's not the case that there are 582 planners out in the field. In fact, there are even less than that. Uh, well, no, they're still out in the field, but the location, yeah, they're still out in the field. Well, some of them are sitting back in head office in order to provide this support, is that right? Uh, yes, um, but they, they're the team that actually they can tap into. So those individuals will still be supporting, the, you know, clients that, that we have as well. And is another reason that, the, that you're unconcerned about meeting the ongoing service requirements that you have changed or standardised the nature of those ongoing service requirements? Yes. And does that mean, to put it very bluntly, the service that you are contracting to get now is less time consuming for CFPL than the service that you would be getting had you contracted in 2000 and say 10? No, that's not right. The, so service, that you're, the service that you, from an ongoing service arrangement, uh, the experience and what the client receives, 100% depend, depends on what the actual client wants. 
All right, well, we'll <laughs> come back to that. So let me now move to BW Financial Advice. Yes. We've mentioned already that that was acquired by CBA in 2008. Yes. And as with CFPL, BWFA financial advisors are typically employees rather than authorised representatives. That's correct. And BWFA ceased full-scale operations in October 2016. Yes, it did. And what happened to the financial planners that were employed in, at BWFA at that mm -hmm. time? Uh, so they had a few options. Um, so the financial planners could either um, join one of our other licensees or CFPL. I'm sorry, go on. Okay. Um, yeah, so, our so at the time, the financial planners had options. Obviously, the business closed um, and they, they, their roles were made redundant. They could have had options to, um, if, if they chose, to go to work at CFPL or one of our other licensees. And is that what they all did? Uh, different combinations of people. I, uh, I actually left the business in September to take on my new role. So actually the, um, the work and where people ended up, I'm not familiar with, but people took different, different uh, employment operations. Now, I want to just work through the ongoing service packages that were available from CFPL and BWFA over yes. time. Both of those entities offered ongoing service packages? They did, yeah. And could you just explain what you mean by an ongoing service fee package? Okay. Um, and this in, uh, So an ongoing, an ongoing service fee package um, is where a client would pay a fee for an ongoing relationship with their client. They would have certain services that the advisor um, uh, would would have with a, with with that client, and you know, in particular, uh, probably the most important element of an ongoing service relationship is to have an annual review. All right, and between at least 1 January 2008 and I assume now CFPL had an ongoing service package available to its clients? CFPL did, yes. Right. It still has an ongoing service package it available does, to its yes. clients? It still does, yes. Different packages. Does it only have one now? Available? It only has one now, correct. Okay. And you mentioned that the most important element of an ongoing service package is the annual review? Correct, the opportunity for a client to have an annual review. Ah, uh, well that's quite different, isn't it? There's, there's two different things here, aren't there? One is you have a service package, which means you have an, an annual review. And on the other hand, you have a service package, which means that in some sense, you have the opportunity to be offered an annual review. Uh, every ongoing service arrangement uh, in, invites the client for an annual review but it is actually at the client's discretion whether that annual review occurs or, or not. And at the moment then, the package, the one package that CFPL still offers... Yes. ..that contains an offer of an annual review, is that right? Uh, it, it contains, um, yes, yeah, contains an offer of an annual review. And is that an offer that requires the planner to contact the client to make the offer? Correct, yeah. And is that, you say, consistent with what has always been the case, that it's simply a requirement that they be offered an annual review? Correct. But the fee gets paid regardless of whether the annual review occurs? Correct. Right. And BWFA also offered ongoing service packages it for did, about... Yeah. And I just want to break down some of these packages because they've changed. 
there's something that was called the ongoing service package and is now referred to as the legacy ongoing service package. Yep, so you're looking at CFPL first? Yes. Yep, yes. And that was something that was offered from 1 January 2008 until June 2013? Yes. And then there was another package called the standard service package? Yes, standard service was a different package to an ongoing service relationship because standard service did not have an annual review. Well, it didn't have the, the offer of an annual review. There was no annual review in service. There's no possibility of an annual an review. An annual review, correct. And that was offered from 3 September 2009 until June 2013? Correct. And then there was, on 1 July 2013, two new packages that were introduced? They were, yep. One was the ongoing service package? Yes. And the other was, I'm sorry, one was the local ongoing service package, is that right? Yes. And the other was the central ongoing service package. Okay. Uh, yes, so the central ongoing service package, um, again, was a health check and a phone based. So that package itself, like, wasn't considered, it's not, didn't have the ongoing, it didn't have the annual review meeting in there. I understand. This can be quite confusing, I think, <laughs> because it's called the, by you, the yes, central ongoing yes, service yep, package. Yep. But what it doesn't actually have is ongoing service, by your definition, which is an annual review. Uh, yes. Um, yes. Yeah, so it, there is service obligations that the client can have access to a financial advisor, but the actual one component, which is the annual review, uh, yes, isn't in that package. And... CFPL stopped offering the central ongoing service package in November of 2016? It did, yes. Can you explain why it did that? Uh, when we were reviewing uh, the packages that we had, so as part of um, having a look at what we wanted to do going forward, um, we felt that um, from an ongoing service relationship, we wanted one package and, um, and that package uh, to include an, an annual review. And Pathways doesn't have the same packages, but rather it's up to each advisor to craft their own package? Yeah, so Pathways, um, each, each individual advisor will have kind of a list of services that they provide, uh, but the ongoing service package will include an annual review. So a, a service or the standard type service package doesn't in, is not in Pathways, it's only really that one and your review package. And BWFA was offering similarly named packages, that is yep. standard service, ongoing service, local ongoing service, central ongoing yep. service, from about November 2010 until Correct. it was shut down in 2016? Yes. And I'm sorry, I may have asked you this. Why did why was the decision made to shut down BWFA? Okay, uh, so if I can make a distinction, because the license for BWFA is still in existing, but yeah. it doesn't give any financial advice. Uh, when I was um, it, when I was responsible for the business, I did a strategic review. There are a few elements um, that was important to have the Bankwest financial advice model um, ensure that we could could grow the business. The difference between this business and Commonwealth Financial Planning, Commonwealth Financial Planning obviously works very closely with our retail banking customers. Uh, with Bankwest, we weren't as integrated in the Bankwest model. Uh, there were different systems that we were operating off because Bankwest obviously had different systems. And so from a strategic perspective, uh, we needed investment in the business to help it grow um, through that. The Bankwest leadership team, we went to the Bankwest leadership team to ask for that and um, they preferred that we looked at other options to service the Bankwest clients. Uh, off the back of that, we then reviewed and thought that it was more efficient and a better way to offer service for these clients using our existing licensees. Uh, obviously through that process, we had already identified the, um, the, the OGS issue in Bankwest and decided uh, as a go forward, uh, go forward, it is better for those clients to be serviced from our other licensees who are equipped and resourced. 
and so just so I can clarify, it wasn't connected with the extent of the failure of BWFA financial advisors to actually provide service to clients who had contracted for ongoing service? Uh, one of the, sorry, out of the three factors, so one was we needed more investment. Secondly, we already had licensees that had um, uh, established. And the third was we needed, we needed better supervision and monitoring to ensure that the ongoing service packages, yeah, could be delivered. And, and it's the third one that we decided um, that the better way going forward is to use one of our existing licensees where we, are, where we have the supervision and monitoring. Because of the extent to which BWFA advisors were not providing services to their clients. Uh, we didn't have the proper supervision and monitoring and uh, we didn't have the proper supervision and monitoring uh, as a licensee and for those clients wanted to give them the opportunity to, to use one of our other licensees. Are you trying to say because you didn't have the proper supervision and monitoring that therefore BWFA financial advisors were not providing serv ongoing services to their clients and that was the thing of concern? Yes, we... And it yeah. was the extent of that failure to provide services, which was the reason why you decided you needed to move those clients to other businesses? Yeah, it was one of the three contributing factors, yes. All right. Now, the legacy, or what's referred to by you as the legacy ongoing service package, that contained an obligation to have an annual meeting, is that right? Correct, yep. And if the client did not want to have an annual meeting, did that have any effect on the fees that were charged? No, the fees, uh, the fees for these packages, it wasn't actually differentiated between whether the annual review went. Um, if the client decided that they didn't want to have an annual review, then that was, that was their choice. I, I just want to understand this a little bit better. Can we bring up Ms Perkovich's statement, CBA.9000.0006.0001? This is your first statement of the 3rd of April 2018, Ms Perkovic. Yep. And if we go to paragraph... I'm sorry, if we go to page dot triple zero four. And you see in paragraph 24, a consistent core component of the legacy ongoing service package was an annual review meeting. Yes. And you explained there that from January 2008 until around September 2009, the template statement advice would provide at each annual meeting we will revisit your objectives, cash flow management, investment strategy, tax planning and any other issues such as estate planning and social security in line with any changes in the year ahead. Yes. And then in, from September 2009 until June 2013, you explained in paragraph 25 that the template statement of, of advice became even more explicit about this. You will meet with me at least annually to discuss your financial plan. During this meeting, I will discuss with you whether your goals have changed and review your plan to ensure it still meets your needs. Yes. So that it would appear as if a fundamental component of the service to be provided under the legacy ongoing service package was the annual meeting and not just an offer of it, it actually occurring. Do you agree? Yes. And your answer to some questions before where you talked about it always only being an offer of an annual meeting, that doesn't seem to quite be correct. Do you agree? Uh, yeah, so the, uh, just want to, because they're, sorry, we're dealing with multiple entities across multiple years. What I was actually trying to say is the package offered the review, but it's actually up to the individual client 
um, to decide on that review. Now, with these packages um, and the review for the periods that, you, you, that you're talking about, we know that um, we had concerns in the business and we had kind of issues where, because of lack of supervision and monitoring, uh, we couldn't determine whether the packages um, and the service had been de delivered and also the existing issues in the business, which is part of the transformation, um, you know, we had documentation issues. So I was just trying to work through, if we're going to go through each of the packages, um, you know, there are solutions and known issues <coughs> that happy to talk through versus going through each of, yeah, each of the, the, the actual packages themselves. Was the known issue with the legacy ongoing service package that the fundamental part of it, which was the annual review, was not occurring? Yeah, uh, for firstly, there's instances of it, obviously, that we find out later that wasn't occurring, and then we didn't have proper systems uh, to record um, that that meeting had happened. So there was known issues in the business with respect to document management, and, um, and secondly, uh, yeah, there, you know, we, we know that some advisors didn't meet their obligations. Is it the position of CFPL 2010, if a client was on the legacy ongoing service package and was offered an annual meeting but declined to attend, that nevertheless CFPL is entitled to a fee for that year? Uh, it, you would have to look at the actual reason for why the client. Yeah, so if the client, if there was, uh, if yeah, so if the client actually chose not to have a review, there was a file note that the advisors would need to put put on, and they need to understand exactly why the client didn't want to to go ahead with that review. So, I think the answer to my question is, yes that the position of CFPL is if the annual review doesn't occur, that doesn't, I'll put the question a different way, that doesn't necessarily mean that CFPL isn't entitled to a fee. If you're talking about a period at that time. Yes, this is in relation yes. to this, to the legacy ongoing service, service package. Yeah. When you're saying if I'm talking about then, does that mean the position has changed? So uh, that now for the most right. recent package, if a review doesn't occur, CFPL won't charge a fee? Uh, the, the review is very, a very important component for people on the ongoing service. So what we have done now is actually ensure that 100% of clients get their review um, and we've put extra controls in place so a client can actually have that, their review. So, um, so every client that is signed up for an ongoing service package will, will have a review. Sorry, we'll have a review or we'll have an offer of a review? We'll get a review as part of their package. Okay. And so the position of CFPL now is if a client declines a review, it doesn't need to pay the ongoing fee? Um, so if a client declines a review, um, sorry, because I think we're just wanting to just make sure that we're, 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 we're clear here. Uh, under with CFPL, the um, the review needs to happen. Now, if a client declines a review, for you know they they actually still need to under, we need to understand like why that client has declined a review, um, and it is up to you know we need to we need to work out whether they need to be on an ongoing service package or not because not every client is on an ongoing service package. So if you decline. Um, just want to work through. So, if you decline a review, so part of your package is the offer of a, is is to actually have a review. Okay. Now, if the client um, decides not to have the review, then it's actually at their discretion. Um, and if I take you to um, you know where we are now, the client then the fees are totally transparent to the client. So, a client gets a fee disclosure statement and every two years will opt in. So it is up to that client to decide. If they decide that they don't want to have review, they have full transparency that they're still being paid, that they still you know, have, have, um, are getting charged for the ongoing service 
package. Do you understand the distinction between I do, yes. an offer of a review and having a review? Yeah. You appreciate that those are two different things? Yes. Is CFPL contracting with its clients to make an offer of a review or to have a review? Okay, it is an offer of an annual review. And does it follow that the position of CFPL is that regardless of whether the review does or does not take place, so long as it in some fashion offers a review, it is entitled to continue to charge service fees yes. to the client? All right. And does CFPL have a way of valuing what an offer of an annual review is? I think if you look on the statement, on my statement at part 53, yes. there is a whole list of, there's actually a whole list of services that, um, that, that we part as part of the ongoing service package. The fees that are charged for the, for the ongoing service package are a flat dollar fee. And, and they're determined um, based on a number, of a number of situations for that client. So depending on what you, depending on um, the type of advice or the investments that you have, will determine what fee you're being charged. And so then that fee is actually for the whole raft of items that are on 53. The fee the flat fee, according to 55 of your statement, can vary from $1,500 per year to a maximum of $21,600 per year? Yes. And I think you were attempting to explain to us how is the actual fee calculated within that range? Okay. So the advisors have a tool, which is called an advice valuation tool, and that tool allows them uh, to um, put in the the actual client situation and off the back of that will determine what fee is being charged. I'm sorry, I just don't know what that means, Ms. Perkovic. What okay. does that mean? So if you're an if you're an ongoing if you're a client and uh, ongoing service is appropriate to you, there'll be a number of factors that will determine what that fee, the flat fee is for you. Uh, for example, it might be um, based on your advice, you might be uh, needing um, you know, more strategic advice, it might be on the amount of investment it, dollars invested, it might be on the complexity of the advice that you have. So it's a whole range of things that the advisors would use to determine what fee would be charged uh, for that ongoing service. Does it vary based on the amount of money that you're investing? Uh, that is one factor, but not the only factor. So is, is one factor that the fee varies to some extent according to how much money you're investing, is that one right? One factor is yes, but not the only factor, because if you have strategic, you might need strategic advice, it might be a self-managed super fund, um, which is more complex. So there's a, there is a, a range of factors but one is, yes, the amount of money that you invest, but it's not the only factor. And does that mean you might charge more to a client that has a self-managed super fund and is investing $250,000 as compared to a client who is investing $250,000 in a wrap platform? Okay, I don't think we would, we would put somebody in a self-managed super fund with that amount of money, but... Um, but it would just be on, yeah, it would, the, the, the value is one part of it, and then there's complexity of the advice that's provided across, across that amount. So if, it might be easier to give a few examples, which I had attempted to do. So for example, you might just be consolidating a group of, of your superannuation assets. 
you might be in a pre-retirement and you need to go to a post-retirement, you know, like a, a pre-retirement moving to a post-retirement strategy where you need um, ongoing service. You, may ha you might have some complexities across that. So there is a range of factors that the advisors use, um, you know, that, that actually helps them determine what the ongoing service fee would be for clients that actually need ongoing service arrangements. Is the starting point how much money is being invested? It's not the starting point, but it is one. The starting point is the complexity of the advice that's provided, um, and then there's a whole range of different issues. So is the way that it works that a CFPL planner will have to categorise the advice to be provided according to its level of complexity? Uh, different strategies d determine different levels of complexity. Okay. And so, to take the simplest possible example, if you have a client that is being put into a RAP platform who is investing $250,000, they will pay less than a client who is investing $500,000 in a RAP platform. Uh, depending, uh, that, um, not trying to not answer your question, but it's just not a simple answer because it just does also depend on other factors that might be, um, that you need in the, in the advice relationship. So if all things are equal, um, that may be a determining factor, but it doesn't always come out. It, it, there's no, it doesn't always come out that way because if you have more money, um, you might, it, it's not a determining factor on the complexity of it. All right. Can we go back to paragraph 24 of your statement, which is on page dot triple zero four? What you're explaining here is the legacy ongoing service package, which we've looked at, where, as you've noted and I've noted, a critical component is the annual review. Yep. Let me see if I understand your position correctly. Do you regard this component of having an annual review as being equivalent to the component in the local ongoing service package of an offer of an annual review? Well, the way that this is worded is that you would have a meeting each year. Yes. Yeah. So you're agreeing, I think, that this means that this is different, this required a meeting, as distinct from an offer of a meeting? The way that it's worded, yes. I'm sorry, you keep <laughs> saying that, the way that it's worded. I'm asking about how you understood it, and yes. you have been in the business for the last five years at least. Have you understood that there is a difference between what was being offered in 2013 and what is being offered now? Yeah, so I think you referred to the legacy ongoing package, um, which varied around, yeah, the different components, but yes. Let's move to a different topic. I want to ask about the discovery of the fees for no service issue. Yes. When did you first become aware that there was a potential issue of clients of CFPL being charged ongoing service fees but not receiving the service? Um, so there's obviously three components of issues um, that CFPL was working Vic, through. I have hesitated to interrupt you. Uh, I will interrupt once. Yes. We will get on better if you listen to Council's question. Yep. If you have to stop and think about the question, do it. But listen to Council's question and answer what you are asked. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner. Please put the question again. Thank you, Commissioner. Ms Perkovic, when did you first become aware that there was a potential issue of clients of CFPL being charged ongoing service fees but not receiving the service? Okay. It was a, um, the actual potential issue, not um, if it is just called a potential issue in the business, then that is off the back of um, work that we did, uh, which we were trying to identify 
what other issues um, you know, were in the business at the time of the transformation. When I found out that there, that, that there was the possibility of the issue um, with respect to the ongoing service arrangement, it actually was after we did um, a thorough review across the 13 and 14 year. Let's start with the Henderson memo. Could Ms Perkovic be shown CBA.0523.0001.04.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0
Perhaps the way we'll do this, Ms. Perkovic, is to walk through the Henderson memo as it is the earlier document in time yep. and then go back to the email. So the memo is dated the 12th of April 2012. Correct. It's from Ms. Henderson to Ms. Chambers. Yes. Were you aware of a request that Ms. Chambers had made to Mr. Henderson for the memo? Uh, I wasn't, I was only aware once the memo came out. You were only, and was the first time you were aware of the memo when you received the email on the 3rd of May 2012? Correct. And the memo explains that its purpose is to provide an outline of ongoing advice, service, offering and information on the manner in which the business identifies, records and tracks OGS clients to then inform potential risks that exist in relation to them. Correct. And then in paragraph two, it identifies what it is that OGS clients are told that they will receive. Yes. And then in paragraph three, it explains that, it explains how the business currently ensures it delivers its OGS obligations. Correct. Or perhaps more accurately, it explains that the business doesn't really do anything to ensure that it delivers its OGS obligations. Okay. The two, um, yes, the two issues uh, from this memo is one, at that point in time, um, uh, Ms Henderson, based on the information that was available, uh, found that there were clients that were attached to advisors who had departed. So that was actually one issue. So we had OGS clients that were attached to an advisor that actually had departed the business. It didn't record whether, um, whether service was delivered or not. Um, so that's actually um, a component in there. It goes on to say that there's an identification of 257 clients that on that point or that time when that report, when that memo was, was made, those, uh, those clients did not or not, were not attached to an advisor. So what we knew was that we had a, an issue with how our clients were allocated uh, once a depart, an advisor departed. Well, let's, let's attempt to take this piece by piece. And again, if you could just try to focus on the questions that I ask you and answer those questions. Yep. In section three, what is being considered by Ms Henderson is how the business actually tries to meet its ongoing service obligations. Do you agree? The section is titled, how does the yes. business currently yes. ensure it delivers its o OGS yes. obligations? Yep. You see that? Yes. You agree that that is what that section is considering? Yes, it's outlining them, yes. And it explains that to the client confirming the offering to the client. You see that, yes. the first sentence? Yeah. And then it explains that the financial planner is required to flag the client as being an OGS client in COIN. Yes. What is COIN? COIN is the financial planning software. That is used by CFPL? By CFPL at the time. And then it explains that a timetable of the OGS obligations are, is available on the intranet. Yes. And the timetable, it is said by Ms Henderson, is generally kept as a hard copy in the client file with diarised reminders. Correct. But then it explains there is no licensee standard which outlines this process and we do not have sufficient information available to verify whether or how the coin process is being utilised or the monitoring method. You see that? Yes. And so if we return to the question that I asked you a few minutes ago, what the memorandum explains is that CFPL doesn't really do anything to ensure that it delivers its OGS obligations. Do you agree? What the memo is telling us at the time is that there is no yeah, supervision and monitoring to identify whether the obligations, um, whether we are delivering the service. It's not saying the service isn't being met. And then the memo goes on to explain the financial planner is required to maintain a register of all their OGS clients. Correct, yep. But the register is not audited for accuracy. 
Yes. And the departing planners may refuse or be unable to provide that register on departure. Yes. And then over the page, page two. We can go to the top of the page. It then explains a check of the existence of OGS checklists for specific clients are conducted when general file reviews are completed by advice assurance, advice quality coaches and financial planning managers. Yes. And what that section then is identifying is the absolute limit of what it was that CFPL was doing at the time to check that ongoing service obligations were being met by its employee employed advisors. Do you agree? Yes, so it's yeah, it's identifying that the lack of ongoing uh, that it is identifying the lack of supervision and monitoring systems. All right, and then in section four, this is then when it turns to consider what happens when a financial planner leaves the business. Yep, and this is when it then moves to identifying the orphan client issue. Yes, and it explains that. At present, when the financial planner leaves their role as the financial planner, it is the FPM's obligation to ensure all clients are transferred to new planners within the business. Yes. And is FPM financial planning manager? Manager, correct. And it's explaining the FPM needs to ask for a copy of the OGS register from the financial planner. Yes. And if the register is able to be relied upon, the clients are transferred. Yes. And that's a reference back to the fact that no one actually audits the registers. Yes. And if the register is not available or not complete, then the financial planning manager has to investigate further to identify who the financial planner's client base is. Yes. And it's explained that this is currently done manually using a number of data sources. Yep. And it then identifies the first source of data as being the CFP operations team. Yes. And how that list is collated. Yes. And then it explains that there was no source of truth identified in Ms Henderson's investigations to reflect a single reference point of all OGS clients. Yes. That the collation of OGS clients is a manual investigation involving searches of multiple different <laughs> databases and sources of information. Yep. And Ms Henderson observes that even with thorough investigations, clients can be missed due to issues with advisor codes. Yes. And you referred before to the 257 clients. Can we be clear about what Ms Henderson said about the 257 clients? She said, on my initial and very brief analysis of FMS slash first choice data, I've identified 257 clients who are paying OGS fees and who are not assigned to a financial planner. Correct. And you certainly don't mean to suggest that she was in any way suggesting that the problem was limited to 257 clients? The MIMO um, at that time, yes, yeah, suggested on her analysis that there was 250, on that day, there were 257 clients, correct, who were paying OGS fees and um, weren't attached to a financial planner. The MIMO, which we have in front of us, yes. said that there were 257 clients that she had identified on a very brief and limited review. Yes. You agree that in no way does it suggest that the problem is limited to 257 clients? No, no, I agree, yes. And then... But it does... Uh, I, uh, sorry, I just want to be clear because it is a point in time and the process to actually allocate clients to the planners who had departed, you know, would vary across the, across the time. So I just wanted to be clear because it's, it's a... It is a, an issue that's identified. Um, and the second part, which you're talking about, the supervision um, and monitoring or lack of systems to do that, is, um, you know, it, basically the memo is telling us, yes, that, you know, we, we um, you know, have this current concern with the 257 clients who are not attached to an advisor, and we have limited supervision or no supervision and monitoring um, you know, uh, we, uh, on, you know, with, with respect to, to issues. 
the context that I just want to provide, if you allow me to provide, is that this is a time of the business that we are going through significant transformation. I think it's important to identify that um, because it will help put some context as to what is happening in the business at the time. So from, is that okay if I, if I do that? Yeah. Yeah. Ms. Perkovic, yes. is the reason that you are dissembling in the way that you are dissembling because you are trying to preemptively explain why it took CFPL more than two years to notify ASIC of its breach? I'm trying to, yes, I'm trying to, um, sorry, I'm just trying to explain to you in this two year period bef before we actually identified that we actually had a problem with OGS as to what we were solving for with the information that was in front of us in a broader context of the business. Ms Perkovic, I do not regard that as answering council's question. Please ask the question again. I want you to listen to it and I want you to answer it directly as you can. Please okay, put the question you. again. Yeah. Apologise. Ms Perkovic, is the reason that you are dissembling in answering my question in order to attempt to preemptively explain why it is that CFPL took more than two years to notify ASIC of its breach? So at the point in time in 2012, there was no known breach. When we knew the breach had occurred in 2014, that is when we notified ASIC. Ms Perkovic, if you look at the memo, you see that Ms Henderson explains how she captured the 257 clients. That's yes, in the third last paragraph from the bottom. Yeah. And then you see the second last paragraph says, the initial analysis has not captured those financial planners who have left the business and who still have active CFS first choice advisor codes due to time constraints it is highly likely that there will be more clients captured on conducting a more in-depth analysis. Yes. And then it says there is a project on hold that was being led by, is that Hussein Boztep? Yep. Senior Manager Strategic Development, Wealth Management Finance Strategy to investigate the OGS issues. I was not able to find out when or if this project would resume. You see that? Yes. And what was the project that had been put on hold? Okay, that project uh, was not the issue um, with, with identifying any failure in OGS. It was actually a piece of work that was happening in the business that was looking at OGS packages. At the ongoing service packages, is that right? Yes. That's what the project it's totally was looking at? a separate, different. And was it looking at whether OGS was being provided? It was not, no. It was just looking at the composition of the, of the OGS yeah. packages, is that right? The business was looking at, um, uh, the, leading into FOFA, I think the business was looking at what are the ongoing service packages and how they could be reviewed. And that was actually what this program of work was doing. All right, so you, and you were aware of what that project was at the time you received this memorandum? No, I wasn't. When did you find out what the project was? Uh, I found out after, when I made some inquiries, because we weren't sure. Um, we, we just wanted to clarify exactly what was occurring and in, within, within, within the business. All right, well, the memo is dated the 12th of April 2012. You received it as an attachment on the 3rd of May 2012? Yes. Had you already received the memo in some other form before the email that we have? Uh, this memo, no. Okay. Yeah. So you received the memo, you saw the reference to the project, and then you made some inquiries to find okay. out what that project was? I just want to clarify that it is two separate issues here. The OGS reference in that email, memo stems off um, other issues. The OGS issues, and I think this is why, um, and I apologise at not answering your direct questions because I wanted, I just wanted to put some context. This well, was a Ms. program. Perkovic, I will interrupt you. Yeah. We will get along <laughs> much. <laughs> Sorry. More, just listen. To me. Yes. We will get along much more quickly and efficiently. Yes. And if I may put it quite bluntly, it will be safer for you if you attend to Council's questions. Listen to them, 
If you need to stop and think about your answer, yeah. take your time, stop, think, but then answer the question you are asked and stop. Okay, I apologise. Go on, Mr Hodge. Thank you. Okay. Ms Perkovic, perhaps yes. if I just ask another question, maybe we have misunderstood. The attachment to the email of the 3rd of May 2012, are you saying it is not Ms Henderson's memorandum? Yeah, the update on OGS, which Annabelle is, um, was requested by Annabelle in Peter, is actually, this is off the back of this memo, but the actual um, project that's being put on hold here is not a project to identify whether ongoing service was delivered. This was a piece of work that was already happening in the business around uh, ongoing service packages. So it's a separate piece of work that, that, that was actually happening in the business on, at the time. I, th I think I understand. Let yeah. me see if I can attempt to put it back to you in a way so that we can all be on the same page. In the document, which is the email from Mr Sutherland to you, which attaches an OGS memo dot DOCX, you yes. see that? The yes. OGS memo dot DOCX is the memorandum from Ms Henderson yes. that is on the left-hand side of the page. Is that yes. right? And what you're saying is that Ms. Or Annabelle, Ms. Spring, was undertaking some different project and this memo was provided in response to a request that she had made for an update. Uh, so Annabelle, um, off the back of this memo, it identified that we on, the, on this day, we had a, clients that were not allocated to financial planners, and we also told us that we had issues with supervision and monitoring. The most important component of this it, is that it told us that we needed to investigate this further. The memo in here does reference another separate piece of work that's happening, um, titled OGS Issues, but it actually is not in reference to any of this. It is actually a separate piece of work that was happening at the time of the business, which they were just looking at OGS packages. So there was no real, um, no real link or looking, looking at that piece of work around whether OGS was being provided or not. I'm sorry, I just yes. do not understand okay. <laughs> why sorry. anything that you are telling us matters. Why does it matter that there was some other project looking at the composition of OGS packages? Um, why is it preventing you from being able to answer my questions? Because I feel that we're just... The, the, the complexities around this is that I think the title of looking at OGS issues in that piece and then having a look at this memo and then actually um, having a look at that, it seems to be tying together a piece of work that's having a look at whether OGS is being delivered or not. And that's what I just feel the facts of these, aren't there? There was a memorandum that was yes. prepared by Ms Henderson yep. in April of 2012, and we've seen that. You agree? Correct, yes. I tender that document, Commissioner. Yes. Um, I have to say, it's now so long ago I've lost I'm sorry, my it's, note of what the... Uh, it's CBA.0001.0089.3796. I'm sorry, 3797. Exhibit 2.81, uh, Memorandum Henderson to Chambers and others, is that right? 12 April 2012, CBA 0001-0089-3797. Thank you, Commissioner. Exhibit 2.81. And that memorandum was <coughs> received by you no later than the 3rd of May 2012 when it was attached to this email? Um, yes. I tender that email, Commissioner. Email Sutherland, Perkovic and others, 3 May 2012, CBA 0523 001 0451 will be exhibit 2.82. Thank you. And what the email from Mr Sutherland asks you and Ms Lacouris to do is to 
size the exposure align along a range of scenarios? Correct, yes. And that was size the exposure in relation to the issues raised by Ms Henderson? Uh, one of the issues, um, and, and sorry, I know that I just wanted to be really, can I just be kind of really clear on here, is the MIMO here is actually sizing one issue, which is about, um, you know, we have clients or orphan clients, as we call them, to be, allocate, to be allocated. A separate, in the time, and, and I, sorry, I just need to, I feel like I just need to provide some context, because at the time of the business, we obviously are going through transformation and there's known issues that we are working through. One is off the back of enforceable undertaking that we have. One is off the back of remediation. And at this time, we are then looking for a third stream of work, which is we know a lot of, we know, we know um, obviously off the back of the enforceable undertaking at CFP at the time, there's document management issues and there's a whole range of issues that we need to solve in the business and we are transforming. The second piece is that we're doing a remediation program for inappropriate advice. Off the, re the request off here is what are the, you know, let's actually, you know, keep seeing what other issues potential issues there are in the business that we need to fix as part of our transformation that's happening in the business. So the Henderson memo was off the back of what else could there possibly be that we don't know at the time, but need, you know, we actually really need to, to look into. This memo here identified the allocation of clients when they, um, you know, when we had an advisor departing and also told us that we need to do some more work to investigate what the actual issues are. So at this point, it's a memo giving us indication that more work needs to be done to identify. It's not telling us that we have an ongoing issue other than 250 clients on that day are not allocated to an advisor that are paying ongoing service arrangements. So off the back of the memo, we allocate these clients to ensure that they, are, that they are receiving ongoing service. The second piece of work that we do is improve the process for allocating advisors. And so that's an important context piece here. But this, is, this request here is us trying to understand what other unknown issues there are in the business as we're working through our known issues of the enforceable undertaking, of the remediation, and what else possibly could that, could that be. It's not suggesting that we have a piece of work ongoing, which is looking at whether we are uh, meeting our ongoing obligations or not. It's just a very specific, different piece, which is the culture of, what other, you know, what possibly could, could else be in the business? We need to review that and find that. And that's the context why I apologise, I'm struggling, but I just wanted to give you the full picture as to what this memo was about. So it's not telling us that we have OGS issues, it's telling us we need to continue to investigate to find whether or not we have an issue in the business or not. Ms Perkovic, you're not seriously suggesting, are you, that you understood from that memo that any problem was limited to 257 clients? The problem, uh, the, when we received the memo, the memo, we identified at that time that we had a problem with actually uh, departing clients and allocating, um, sorry, departing advisors and allocating those advisors. So that was one component. The second component of it was that we needed improvements to our supervision and monitoring framework that was already going on off the back of the enforceable undertaking um, with respect to CFPL. Ms Perkovic. So it was telling me that we still needed to identify Ms Perkovic, yes. can we just return to the question that I asked you? You're not seriously saying, are you, that you understood from this memo that the problem was limited to 257 clients? 
The two things from this memo was, yes, the problem of orphan clients, and second was we needed to investigate further. Is the answer to my question, no, you're not saying that. You well understood that there was some issue wider than 257 clients, you just didn't know how wide. I didn't know if I had a problem or not at the time. And so this memo was telling me that we needed to investigate further as to one, was there a problem? And two, the extent of that problem. You didn't know that you had a problem when the memo said there is no licensee standard which outlines any process. We do not have sufficient information to verify whether the process is being utilised or the monitoring method. We are not requiring financial planners to maintain a register of their OGR clients. This register is not audited for, a for accuracy. It is also the case that departing planners may refuse or be unable to provide that register on departure. There is no source of truth identified in my investigations to reflect a single reference point for all OGS clients. Everything is done manually and via a number of data sources. And in the case of a departing financial planner, it is necessary for the financial planning manager to effectively require the departing financial planner to provide a copy of the register or otherwise to manually attempt to figure out who the financial planner's client base is. That's what the memo says. Do you really say you didn't understand that there was a problem? The memo was telling me that I needed to investigate. And the request that was made of you by Mr Sutherland was to scope the size of the problem. Do you agree with that? The memo at the time... No, um, no, 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 no. Yes. Please listen to my question. Yes. Mr Sutherland asked you to scope the size of the exposure. Of the unknown issue, yes. And you did that? We tried to do that. Can we bring up CBA.0523.0001.0492? This is an email from you to Ms Spring and Mr Sutherland and copied to Ms Lucuris. You see? Yes. Is AFS a reference to Ms Spring? Yes. And you explain what the, based on limited analysis, what Ms Lacouris has identified so far in terms of the quantification of colonial, of CFPL's potential exposure? So the request, because obviously there is email chains between here, the request from Annabelle was to, um, to actually put together uh, to, to see if we have or what, what a provision would be if, the, if, the, if we did have three components of an ongoing service problem. The first one is the... Um, if we sorry, just, I'm sorry, yes. I'm sorry. Did yes. you just say if we have three components of an ongoing services no, problem? No, there's three That's components. what you just said. Sorry. Uh, sorry, apologise. Um, the memo... I'm just trying to explain what the memo is doing because at this point in time the in the business... The memo the email, Ms Perkovic, yes. your, your attention was directed to the email. Yes. Would you be good enough, Mr Hodge, please, to ask your question again? I'm not sure that the witness has understood it. Thank Would you. Would you ask her Commissioner. again? Ms Perkovic, you sent this email on the 11th of May 2012 to explain yes. what Ms Lacouris had identified as the potential quantification of the potential exposure. Correct. And you explained in your email that there were three key issues which would potentially, in your words, impact us. There were three, correct, yeah. The first was ongoing service fee, fee cap breaches. Yes. The second was ongoing service fee reimbursements. Yes. And the third was client remediation costs. Yes. And in relation to the second, ongoing service fee reimbursements, you explain in your email, this is where we have failed to provide the service. You see that? Yes, this is explaining. Um, can I take a moment just to go through the memo? Do you mean 
this email? This email, sorry, yep. The first problem, um, the first one, which is the OGS fee cap breaches, was a, was, was a known issue that we um, had, had, had worked through. What the, what the memo, the second part was obviously the issue um, if we do have um, orphan clients. And the third component is, the, is where o OGS is not being delivered, correct? Now at this time, I just want to be clear is that we don't know the scope of that third component, which is actually has ongoing service been delivered or not. We're trying to size an unknown problem to um, to put to, to actually see that um, you know if there was a problem that we had in the business with respect to OGS, what would be the, 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 the what would be the potential exposure? But we weren't saying that we actually had the problem in the business at the time, and that's pretty the importance of that is that what we're trying to do is really um, see, you know, what are the other issues through the transformation that we actually need to need to look at. And so the context at the time of the, the EMO, and I know the wording of it, is that we don't, it's not saying that we have an issue, it's just basically saying what's our potential through that, through that, through that process. The two known issues was that we did have a fee cap breach. We did know, um, you know, clearly that we'd have this, you know, orphan allocated issue, but the one where advisors were not delivering their services was not known whether that was occurring at the time. We did know that we didn't have effective supervision and monitoring. Yes, we did know that, but we had no other indicators to indicate that 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 was happening at that time of the business. What we needed to know was that we actually needed to investigate further, and that's what we did. Um, that's what we did um, across the 2013-14 year. Ms. Perkovic, your email says we have three key issues which will potentially impact us. Yes, yeah, so this email here is the, the email from, yes, we, we try, so Annabelle is asking us, and Ms. Spring is asking us, you know, what are the potential issues that we have in the business? I know the wording's not, um, you know, is, is that, but it's actually trying to scope an unknown problem that we have. Can I suggest this to you? It's not yeah. an unknown problem. What was unknown was the value of the exposure of CFPL to the problem. What we didn't know was whether the service was being delivered or not to clients who had ongoing service arrangements. Well, you knew that there was no supervision or monitoring and you knew that there were some orphan clients. Sorry, off the back of the OGS memo, yes. And you identify that there are these two situations. The first is where the advisor fails to provide service in dealing with their clients. The second is where the advisor has left and we, that is CFPL, reassign the client for a period of time to an EM, FPM or regional support planner. Yes. And what you were attempting to do was assess the likely exposure of CFPL to each of those problems. potential problems for the ongoing service delivery at this stage, it, it is unknown. You say in your words at the time in relation to the first issue of the advisor fails to provide service in dealing with their clients, the total exposure for this is unknown but I have estimated to be three million dollars. Okay, the I in there is Miss Lycouris. I'm sorry, Ms. Lycouris had made that estimate. Miss Lycouris had Are you made that you estimate. You didn't agree with it at the time. Sorry, I, no, Are I didn't say saying... I didn't agree with it. I said so Miss Lycouris. Miss Lycouris um, is being instructed to for a you know, to to see what the potential exposure we could have in a raft of ongoing service problems. Now that is yes, if a client, if there is, if a, if an advisor fails to deliver a service to their clients, 
then that's obviously an issue, but she's not actually saying that at that time CFPL is failing to deliver service to ongoing service clients. That was unknown at the time. In relation to the orphan clients issue, what is explained is that the advisor has left and the client has been reassigned for a period of time to an EM, FPM or regional support planner. Yes. What is an EM? An executive manager. We know what an FPM is. What is a regional support planner? Uh, so that would be a support person that the advisor, so it's a, a planner, of, uh, in effect a financial planner. All right. You, the reason it's framed in that way is because you knew at the time that clients were being reassigned to an EM, FPM or regional support planner. You agree? Uh, off the back of the memo, correct, yes. And you also knew at the time that it was unlikely in those circumstances that the client would be serviced during that period? Yes. And then the potential qualification is how vigilant CFPL has been in the past in reallocating clients? Yes, will vary. But the estimate is that the exposure is potentially $2 million. Potentially correct, yeah. Are you trying to once again suggest that you didn't know that this orphan client issue was a problem, it was just some ephemeral possible problem? Okay. Off the back of the OGS memo, we had identified at that time that clients were not assigned to a financial planner. To remediate that issue, they would be assigned to a planner so that service could be delivered within that period. If clients couldn't, be, couldn't get service delivered through that period, then yes, um, service wasn't delivered and that would be an orphan issue where we would go, go on and remediate that. Now, you're aware, I assume, that on the 6th of June 2012, Deloitte issued a draft report? They did. And... Just before we come to that, is this email to go in? I'm sorry, yes, Commissioner, I attend to that. Exhibit 2.83, the, the email Perkovic to Spring and others, 11 May 2012, CBA 0523 0001 0492. Sorry, you were going to a Deloitte. Thank you, Commissioner. The Deloitte had been engaged at some time in May 2012? Yes, we, um, we, well, yeah, we engaged Deloitte to come and help us with a third piece of work that we were doing at the business, which was to help us identify any potential issues that we have in the business. We had known issues with, with, with respect to client remediation. We had known issues in transforming the business through, through the back of the enforceable undertaking, but we wanted to then actually have a look at what else is out there as part of our transformation. And that was the purpose of engaging Deloitte. Can we bring up CBA.0520.0002.7779? This is the draft report of Deloitte? Yes. Dated the 6th of June 2012? Yes. Did you see it at the time? That is yes. on, the, on about the 6th of June 2012? Yep. Do you know why it was never finalised? Um, yeah, I'm not sure why it wasn't finalised, but we certainly treated it as being... You treated this as being yes. effectively the final report? Yep. All right. And then if we go to... Page 7800. <coughs> so this sets out a summary of different issues. Yes. And do you see in the middle of the page 
the issue ongoing advice service. Yes. And it's rated as high. Yes. And the interim priority rating high is explained as meaning scope area may contain a potential issue that is considered of high priority to examine as part of phase two. Yes. And if you then go to page 7815. You'll see this is a section titled Scope Area 6 Ongoing Service Overall Priority Rating High. Yes. Related Risks, Ongoing Service Not Provided Despite Fees Charged, Obligations and Customer Agreements Are Not Understood, Monitored and or Complied With, Clients Are Not Appropriately Notified When a Significant Event Has Occurred and the Funds They Have Invested In. Yes. You see that? Yep. And you see that it then identifies potential issues, which are systems to identify clients that have signed up to and or receive ongoing service arrangements are inadequate. And the priority rating is high and the common is a known issue with CBA wealth management and a common issue with other industry participants. You see that? Yes. And then the process to identify and communicate with customers in a timely manner is ineffective. That's also high, it has the same description. Process to monitor whether authorised representatives follow processes and procedures in relation to ongoing advice service. That's also high management report a difficulty in identifying such instances outside of AA reviews. Yes. AA is advice audit. Audit at that time, yes. And then over the page... Licensee standards may be ineffective in providing guidance on compliant and quality advice. Purpose of rules, that is whether purpose is to achieve compliance or an interpretation of leading practice unclear. And the priority rating is medium and the comment is not a known issue with CBA wealth management, however, has been identified as an issue with other industry participants. Yes. And do you say, having received this report, that you still weren't sure whether you had an issue about the provision of ongoing service to clients? The report told us what we knew, which was that we didn't have effective systems and monitoring to be able to identify <coughs> had service not being delivered. It didn't tell us that we weren't delivering ongoing service. Can I make sure that I'm understanding the reason you're so emphatically emphasising what you describe as context? Yep. Is the explanation that you want to offer as to why it is that it took CBA more than two years to notify ASIC of its ongoing service fee problems, that CBA systems were so hopeless that it had no idea what was going on in its business? The, the issues with, that we had with our systems were already known and we were remediating that as part of the CFP enforceable undertaking that was happening in the business. So yes, that's, that, that enforceable undertaking, and that's why I just wanted to provide the context to that, was already a known issue. And what we were working on was building systems of supervision and monitoring and, um, and supervision and, 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 and frameworks to actually um, satisfy the concerns that ASIC had in the enforceable undertaking of the business in, that, that was in the business from 2011. So we were working on those known issues, which was, yes, there were no systems uh, and there was inadequate supervision and monitoring at that time. That was a known issue and we were working on remediating that through the enforceable undertaking. But the answer to my question is yes, isn't it? Yes. Yes. And then can we go to... I'm sorry, I tendered that document, Commissioner. Uh, exhibit 2.84 <coughs> will be draft report of Deloitte, 6 June 2012, CBA 0520-002-7799. Can we bring up CBA.0520.0002.6443? This is a 
further draft report of Deloitte. Yes. It's dated the 19th of July 2012. Yes. It's titled the Business Issues Management Report. Yes. And it's referred to sometimes as the BIM report, is that right? Correct, yes. And again, do you know why it was issued as a draft report? I don't know. Do you know we, treat, we treated it as a final. All right. And again, you saw it at the time? Yes. All right. And if we go to 6445, in this executive summary, Deloitte set out the scope of what they've been asked to do. Yes. And they explain they have four core objectives. You see that? Yes. The first is to provide, compile a comprehensive list of potential risks in the financial advice business. Correct. The second is to assess potential latent issues agreed with CBA Wealth Management. Yes. The third is to identify high risk planners based on a set of risk criteria agreed with CBA Wealth Management. Correct. The fourth is to propose recommended actions for improvement. Correct. And the risk categories which are identified under the heading approach identify 13 risk categories that have been agreed with CBA Wealth Management as in scope for the engagement. You see that? That's right, yeah. And number six is ongoing advice service. Yes. And number seven is advice fees. Yep. What was number 13, revenue leakage? Um, I don't recall that one. I, I'm, I mean, I asked because it appears yes, as no. if yeah. the one thing you did have systems to track was to make sure that you were getting revenue. Yes. And then can we go to 6446? And this explains what the key findings are. And you see there's a heading overcharging and undercharging of fees. Yes. It explains controls have not been designed to prevent fees being overcharged or under, undercharged. Yes. And there's a curious explanation, which is there's only 180 clients that have been identified as currently being overcharged ongoing service fees by a total of $35,000 each year. Yes. And 5,000 ongoing service clients paying less than the minimum relevant FS FSG fees by $4.3 million. Yes. But then goes on to add a qualification, which is, however, if these clients are found to not be receiving ongoing service fee, ongoing service due to data quality, then they appear to have been overcharged for standard service fees. Yes. And then under the heading ineffective provision of ongoing service, it explains clients in ongoing service programs are at risk of not receiving contracted services due to a number of observed deficiencies. Yes. And it explains controls have not been designed to ensure that ongoing service clients are reviewed on an ongoing basis. Yep. An ongoing basis. Yep. It explains clients have been flagged in FMS as OGS clients are not always on OGS programs. Yes. It explains clients may be removed from ongoing service without the client being consulted. Yes. And Deloitte, as at this date, have explained that we identified over $700,000 in ongoing service fees being charged on an annual basis to over 1,050 clients that are allocated in the system to over 50 inactive planners that left before 2012. Yes. And they make a recommendation which is starting with sample based analysis, validate whether issues are due to data quality or whether OGS services have been provided develop and document effective controls for managing an OGS client, including initial setup, ongoing service and remo removal from yes. the program. Do you still say to the Commissioner that as at this date on reading this report, you still weren't sure whether or not you had an issue in relation to ongoing service fees being charged for no service? Uh, can I just break it down to three components? I don't want to... Um so at this stage, we knew what was known at the time was that we didn't have the correct, the correct systems to, to monitor. We didn't know whether it was an issue, but we knew that we did not have systems to supervise and monitor uh, the effective provisioning of ongoing service, yes. 
Did you doubt what Deloitte had told you? Uh, we didn't doubt the fact that we knew at the time of the business, we knew that we didn't have the systems. Sorry, I don't think you're quite yeah. grappling with my question. My question okay. was quite narrow. Did you doubt what Deloitte told you? No. If we go to page 6448. This is the findings or the summary of findings by Deloitte. You see finding number two, overcharging and undercharging of fees, finding rating very high. Yes. Finding number three, ineffective provision of ongoing service, finding rating very high. Yes. And then if we go to 6451, we see the rating methodology, which explains what a very high finding means. Yes which is for the client, the finding may lead to significant loss in client numbers or significant client restitution. Yes. As a legal and regulatory issue, the finding may result in systemic and or significant breaches <coughs> resulting in a loss of major fines or significant regulatory action. That is to say, enforceable undertakings, license condition changes. Yes. And operational finding may lead to significant data integrity issues or significantly impact ongoing effectiveness or efficiency? Yes. And then if we go back a page to 6450, see so this is a chart setting out the recommendations made by Deloitte and categorised according to Level of, level of effort along the x-axis and potential value along the y-axis. Yes. And recommendation four is develop effective OGS management system. Yes. And that is rated very high in potential value and level of effort. Yes. It is in the top right corner, it must be the most serious of all of the issues. Yes. And then if we go to 6452, at the bottom of page two, we can see there's a more detailed explanation of overcharging and undercharging of fees. Yes. And then if we go over to page 6454, you see there's a more detailed explanation of the findings as to the ineffective provision of ongoing services. Yes. Do you agree that at the time of this BIM report, CFPL did not have effective controls in place to prevent ongoing service fees being charged inappropriately? Yes. Do you agree that CFPL did not have effective controls in place to assess whether clients were receiving the services for which they were being charged? Yes. Do you agree that CFPL did not know what advice was being given to clients who were paying for ongoing advice? Yes. Do you agree that CFPL did not have controls in place to ensure that when an advisor left, the advisor's clients were moved to a new advisor? Yes. Do you agree that CFPL did not have controls in place to stop fees being charged to clients who became orphaned? Yes. Do you agree that CFPL did not have controls in place to ascertain if clients were being notified of significant events that may require action to be taken to protect their position? Yes. Do you agree that CFPL used ad hoc systems to store data that could not be centrally checked other than by manu manual processes? Yep. Do you agree that CFPL habitually charged clients for services that were not provided? Uh, we didn't know whether the services were provided or not. Well, you knew that at least in the yes. case of 1,050 clients, it was by Deloitte's consideration <coughs> at least highly likely, if not certain, that these clients were not being provided yep. with services because they were they were allocated to 50 inactive yep. inactive planners. 
You agree? Yep. So I'll ask my question again. Do you agree that as at the date of this report, CFPL knew that it habitually charged clients for services that were not provided? We knew that we didn't have the supervision and monitoring to determine whether the services were being provided or not. The very simple reality is, isn't it, that as at the date of this report in July of 2012, CFPL had no capacity to ensure that contracted services were delivered to clients. We did have capacity because we did have financial planners who were the people that were actually delivering the services. What we didn't have was um, the monitoring and supervision of those services and we didn't have many document management systems to record those services. And my question was, do you agree that CFPL had no capacity to ensure that contracted services were delivered to clients at the time of this report? We had, yeah, well, we had no systems to do that, yes. And so what is known is that we need a system to track and monitor ongoing service, absolutely. And so, I'm sorry, I tend to that document, Commissioner. Draft report of Deloitte's 19 July 2012 Business Issues Management Report. CBA 0520-0002-6443 will be Exhibit 2.85. At this time, at the time of this report, the only system that CFPL had in place that was effective in any way was a system for charging clients. Correct. Now, the BIM report, or at least its findings, was presented to the board of CFPL? Yes. And what was the role of that board? Uh, so the CFPL board is an AFSL licensee board. And what was the role of that board in relation to the BIM report? What action, if any, would that board take? Okay. Uh, so the, the, well, the, the paper was presented, um, sorry, the paper was presented to the board as outlying, outlining the things that we needed to continue to work on in the business. So the actions, sorry, the actions was that um, on receiving the BIM report, the action was for management to go and investigate. Um, and the other component um, of this is that we are currently building systems to be able to track this off the back of fee disclosure and FOFA. So the actions of the board was for management to come back um, and actually identify out of the findings from the BIM report what work was already happening and how we would go about to size this potential unknown problem, which is was service delivered or not, and the systems around that. That was what, what, that's what happened after that BIM report. The finding of the BIM report was also presented to the board of CBA? It was, yes. And do you recall when that occurred? It was soon after, it's just in my... Is it about the 14th of August 2012? Yes. Yes. The 14th of August 2012? Or do you not have a date in your statement? Um, okay. It would have been around that time, so... And yes. Can we bring up CBA.0502.0001.4916? This is a meeting, um, some papers 
for the meeting of the board of CBA on the 12th of February 2013. Yes. Do you know what occurred between the BIM report in July of 2012 and the 13th of, or the 12th of February 2013 in relation to fees for no service? Sorry, from... Um, from the date of the BIM report, yes. which is July 2012 until yes. February 2013, did anything occur in relation to fees for no service? Uh, we would have... Um, the work that was happening was the ongoing work, which was developing the tool to track the services. So it was the FDS tool. Um, we also um, commenced the work on the two known issues, which was the, under an overcharging of fees and also the orphan issue in starting to work to setting up a program to identify kind of the scope of that to work towards remediation. Actually, I will, I'll come back to that document yeah. in one moment. Can we bring up CBA.0002.0860.0677? So this is the agenda and papers for the licensee risk committee on the yes. 1st of March 2013. Yes. Were you a member of the licensee risk committee? I was. I'm sorry, you were? Yes. All right. Yes. And have you looked at this document recently? Can you Will you pull up the whole document or? Yes, can we, will we go to the second page? So I'm, what I'm wondering about is, have you looked at the papers for this meeting in March of 2013 recently? You don't recall? I did look at that, sorry. It appears you didn't attend. Of, sorry? You gave an apology to, for that meeting on the 1st of March, all right. Do you recall, given that you're a member of the committee, would you have reviewed the papers for the meeting nevertheless? Yes. All right. Can we go to page ending – I'll just get a non-stapled version. Can we go to page 0792? Thank you. So you see there's an issue at the top of the page which is ongoing service fees. Yes. This is, I can bring this up if necessary, but this is as part of a list of the status of current and emerging matters. Yes. And you see in relation to ongoing service fees it said controls in relation to the charging of ongoing service fees as well as provision of the ongoing service to clients are either not in place or not robust. As a result, clients have been potentially been over or undercharged OGS fees. Correct. These fees have been charged since 1 July 2004. Yes. And a remediation proposal has been completed and submitted to senior management for approval. Yes. And was there some notification given to ASIC in relation to this part of ongoing service fees in 2013? There was. There was a breach report. All right. We'll come to that. And then you see section four, timeliness of breach reportability and assessments. Yes. And 
what's explained is wealth management advice is operating in an environment of increased regulatory and scrutiny. Yes. And 4.3 explains RG78 provides guidance about materiality for reporting of key items and as such our philosophy around potential likely reportable breaches should be to err on the conservative side and this should be on the basis for our risk posture and principles around breach reporting. It is recommended WRM and all licensees adopt a conservative approach about likely or potential breaches. Yes. And at the bottom of the page at the end of 4.4, you see it has been noted by ASIC through recent notices that the process in determining if a matter, and this is over the page, if a matter is a potential and or a significant reportable breach from the time the matter was identified is considerably longer than desired. Yes. And it then explains WRM are reviewing all processes around significant breach reporting. Yes. And then under 4.6, the matters under compliance evaluation are currently considerably high, 26. The need to assess the status of all matters under compliance evaluation should be expedited. Evaluations will be conducted in three categories. You see that? Yes. And then next to other, there is excessive ongoing service fees. Yes. And next account, there is orphan clients assigned to head office paying ongoing advisor commission. Yes. Can I suggest then that you and the other members of the risk management committee, I'm sorry, the licensee risk committee must have been conscious as at March 2013 of First, the significance, the significant emphasis that was now being placed on breach notification by ASIC. Yes. And you understood the criteria that were to be applied. Yes. And you were aware that there were issues in relation to orphan clients. Yes. And you were aware that there were issues in relation to advisors not providing services and there not being any facility to monitor whether services were being provided. We were aware that there was no supervision and monitoring and that was a known issue with respect to um, the enforceable undertaking. We still had to investigate whether or not there was an issue with the delivery of ongoing service. So at this point in time, if I explained uh, the, from respect to the business, we're working with issues that were already reported to ASIC under the enforceable undertaking that we are trying to resolve with respect to supervision and monitoring of the business through the transformation. It was clear there was over and under charging. We breach report that and we remediate that immediately. It was very clear that we didn't have a system or a process um, when advisors left, that clients were allocated. We changed that process and then we looked at what clients were impacted by that so that we could work through that, that process. What we did know at the time was that there was no effective systems and we were working to remediate that in the business. So that's why the context of this and the team and the people in the business who are working through the transformation, it's very clear that they know the ongoing issues that we have. They're very clear as to what has already been reported and working through with the enforceable undertaking and so that's the, the context of, 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 of um, the, the, the areas across that. The other point just to make on this is um, with respect to the issue of significance. So when we evaluate the different areas, it's a known problem that there is no systems. We didn't have a system to identify our clients and we were working through uh, to ensure that we could actually get those systems in place so that we could go ahead and identify have we had non-delivery of, of, of systems. We know that we do because we fast forward to now. So we absolutely apologise for the length of time that it's taken. Um, and I just wanted to provide some context in the business at the time because the focus is very much on remediating the no, known issues and we did know that there was the supervision and monitoring. There's no other indicators telling us that the delivery of the services 
weren't occurring because the delivery is between the advisor and the client. So the fact if the ongoing services were or were not occurring, it is a service that we very much relied on the advisors, uh, uh, the advisors actually doing that service. We knew that we didn't have systems. We knew that we didn't have the supervision and monitoring. It was a known problem that we were remediating with the enforceable undertaking. You took no step in 2013 to notify ASIC of the issue? The known issue at the time of the business was the ineffective supervision and monitoring. The known issue was the overcharging. We did notify ASIC on a breach, uh, from a breach perspective on that. And the um, orphan issues, we were still uh, identifying and assessing and we apologise for the time that it, has, that, that it took, but a lot of these issues really stemmed from the known issue, which was actually lack of systems and lack of supervision and monitoring processes, which were being worked on at that time. Can I tender that document, Commissioner? Licensee Risk Committee Agenda and Papers, 1 March 2013, CBA 0002 0860 will be Exhibit 2.86. How long do you expect to require with Ms Perkovic? I, at this point, I don't expect that I'll finish Ms Perkovic today, Commissioner, I'm sorry. Is it... Uh, therefore appropriate that I should begin at 9.30 tomorrow rather than at 9.45, because well, I think we are now yes. well behind time. I'd be content to start well, even earlier if Council you like, being content is usually the <laughs> quickest sneer that Council can uh, <laughs> produce. Uh, is there any reason why uh, we shouldn't begin at 9.30, Mr Hodge? No, Commissioner. No. <laughs> What about from the CBA side? Is there any... No, no problem with that at all, Commissioner. <laughs> I shouldn't be so cynical, should I, Mr Hodge? Uh, Ms Perkovic, can you be back here in time to uh, uh, recommence your evidence at 9.30 yes, tomorrow you, morning? And I'll adjourn until then. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, Mr Hodge. Thank you, Commissioner. Could we bring up the document CBA.0001.0095.334? Ms Perkovic, you've seen this document before? Yes. This is... Appendix 1 to a response by CBA, or I'm sorry, by Commonwealth Financial Planning Limited to a response to a notice of direction under 912C from ASIC. Yes. Can we go to page 4, the page ending dot 337? You see subparagraph G, the question that was asked by ASIC was, the earliest date that the licensee is able to identify a customer of the ongoing service package who paid for but not, did not receive all components of the ongoing services they are entitled to? The bottom of the page? Yes. And the response is, on 14 July 2008, a complaint was made on behalf of, Mark, of a person in relation to lack of service. Yes. And a fee refund was made? Yes. And then if we go to page 65 of the document, which is dot 3398. So you'll see this is the end of a table setting out complaints that had been made in relation to fees being charged for no service? Yes. So the earliest one identified here is the one on the 14th of July 2008? Yes. And then if we go to the page before that, page 64, 
which is dot 3397. Thank you. You'll see a series of complaints made in 2008, 2009 and 2010. Yes. And then if we go to the page before that, page 63.3396. series of complaints made in 2010 and 2011. Yes. And then we go to page 62, 3395. A series of complaints made in 2011. Yes. And then if we go to page 61, 3394. A series of complaints made in 2011 and 2012. Yes. And then if we go to page 60, 3393. A series of complaints made in 2012. Do you agree? Yep. And then if we go to page 59, 3392. A series of complaints made the earliest of which on this page is 2012 and then going in up until April 2013. Yes. And you maintain, do you, that notwithstanding these complaints, Commonwealth Financial Planning Limited didn't realise that it had a problem with charging fees for no service until it gave a breach notice in August of 2014? We apologise for these client complaints. No, no. Please listen to my question and answer my question. Do you maintain that nevertheless Commonwealth Financial Planning Limited did not know that it had a problem with charging fees and not providing services until it gave a breach notice in August of 2014? No. You don't maintain that? It's incorrect, isn't it? You knew earlier. We knew there were isolated complaints, but not systemic to the nature in 2014. I tender that document, Commissioner. Exhibit uh, 2.87, CFPL response to notice of direction. Have we got a date for it, Mr Hodge? There's not a date on the document, Commissioner. Uh, well, well, if we can describe it as Appendix 1 to the response to notice of direction under Section 912C of the Corporations Act 2001 of Commonwealth Financial Planning Limited, and I will attempt to find a date. So, no matter, I was just trying to identify uh, the exhibit properly. Exhibit 2.87 will be Appendix 1 to CFPL response to notice of direction, CBA 0001 0095 34. Thank you. And then if we can bring up CBA.0001.0039.0405. <coughs> You've seen this email before? Yes. You were copied to it? Yes. It's an email from Peter Taylor of Commonwealth Bank to Ms McCauley of ASIC? Yes. It purports to be an early warning given on the 11th of July 2014 of a potential problem of CFPL in relation to the provision of services for fees? Yes. Why was this sent? Uh, at that time, when we finished the investigation, we recognised the significance of the non-delivery of service. So we did an early warning because we were still we're still investigating uh, the extent of it, but by that stage we knew that it was a systemic problem that, um, that we wanted to escalate and give an early warning to ASIC. Was the purpose of this to attempt to manage ASIC? No, uh, we have um, kind of a good governance where if there is a significant breach, um, but at the time, we're still investigating, so don't know the actual final details. We will do an early warning and then indicate to ASIC when they can expect or when we'll expect our investigation so that we could do a breach notice with the final details. 
you knew in 2012 that you'd received many complaints in relation to fees being charged and no services being provided? Yes. You knew in 2012 that you had no systems capable of confirming whether services had been provided? Yes. You knew that you had systemic issues in I'm sorry, you knew in 2012 that you had systemic issues in relation to registers not being audited, not being handed over to financial planning managers and then having to be manually recreated? Yes. And yet you say that it, even as at the 11th of July 2014, when you gave a note, an early warning notification to ASIC, that you were still investigating whether you had a systemic problem. Is that right? Uh, no, with the early warning is indicating that there is a problem. It's just actually the final details of the investigation. You'd given a notice to ASIC in 2013 yes. in relation to fees not being calculated correctly. Is that right? Yes, that's overcharging of fees. Overcharging or undercharging of fees? Correct. Uh, well, we didn't, sorry, the undercharging we obviously didn't recruit, but it was the overcharging. And that was an issue that was also raised in those Deloitte reports that we looked at yesterday? That was a known issue in the Deloitte report, yes. They raised that there was a systemic issue with not checking whether, with not having fees charged correctly in relation to the fee disclosure statements or product disclosure statements. Uh, there was an issue with that, and that's what they raised. And they also raised this issue about there being no systems at all to check whether services were actually provided? Yes. You gave a notice in 2013 about the overcharging or undercharging of fees? Yep. But you didn't give a notice until August of 2014 about the fact that you had a systemic problem in relation to not providing services in exchange for fees? Um, yes, we, that was actually where we identified that there was a systemic problem. In 2012, the issue with the Deloitte report, which is about the systems and the lack of supervision and monitoring, um, we had already identified that as one of the issues in the enforceable undertaking. So as far as we were concerned, what was coming out of the Deloitte report, which was we didn't have supervision and monitoring, we were already working on fixing and putting that um, in place. This was now confirming that, um, that uh, based on electronic systems that we had now in place and, for, and reviews in that period that we could actually now account for um, lack of delivery for each individual service. Were you drip feeding information to ASIC about the problems with your systems? Uh, sorry, what do you mean by that? Were you not revealing in one go in 2012 or 2013 all of the problems with your systems and instead explaining some problems in 2013 and then giving an early warning notification in 2014 and then finally a breach notification in 2014? So um, as we found issues, we reported them to ASIC after you gave the early warning notification on the 11th of July 2014, ASIC issued a Section 33 notice. That's right. And then after the Section 33 notice was issued, it was only then that CFPL gave a breach report on the 13th of August 2014. Um, I'll just... I'll just check the dates, um, but the intent was always uh, to give ASIC an update once we finished the review by 31st of July. I want to move to a different topic, Ms Perkovic, Before which is... Before you do, are you proposing to tender this email? I am, yes, Commissioner, I tender that document. Exhibit 2.88 will be email Taylor to Macaulay and others, CB of 11 July 14. Uh, CBA 0001 Thank you, Commissioner. I want to now talk 
about the notification given in respect of the count business? Yep. Ms. Perkovic? And you've addressed this in your statement 2-2? Two -two. Yes. We spoke a little about count yesterday. Count operates under a different model from CFPL, you agree? Yes. Whereas CFPL employs, advises, count does not? Correct. Instead, its model is a franchise model where accounting firms employ people who have the necessary financial advisor qualifications. Yes. And they become authorised representatives of count. Yes. And you've identified that the problem that count had was an orphan client's problem? Yes. One of the difficulties for CBA is that it has no real visibility on the services being provided by the count authorised representatives. Do you agree? Chair, for CBA, I take it you I'm mean sorry. CBA? Uh, I'll, FP. I'm sorry, I should actually put that yes. differently. One of the problems for count is that it had no real visibility on what services were being provided by its authorised representatives. Yes, which date are you? Well, certainly as at 2012, 2013. Yes. Now, when the Henderson memo was produced, Yes. which we looked at yesterday, Count was asked whether it could have a similar issue with customers? Correct. And do you recall who asked Count to consider whether it had that problem? Uh, I asked the CEO. And who considered it? The CEO. And what was the report back to you? So they had a look at um, the issue and uh, we're going to confirm through a triage meeting um, and, yeah, come back to me as to what the concerns were. Uh, what then eventuated was that um, there were two items. Uh, one was, um, and I think I mentioned yesterday, the difference in the orphan issue for count versus CFPL. Um, so uh, the issue was that there was inconsistency in the way that we communicated with clients and there was also administrative errors in switching off or dialling up the fee at the point of the time that the client stayed um, within count and didn't leave their advisor. And there was an incident report made into the relevant system on the 7th of May 2012? There was, yes. In May 2012, is that right? Yes. And you explain in your statement that what was set out in the report was Count has an orphan client list that earns fee income of between $1.5 to $2 million per annum. The clients on this list do not receive any type of review as they are not assigned to any particular members. That was in the triage meeting that, um, with the team. I, I didn't attend that. And, but that was the problem, that was the first part of the problem that was identified. There was this significant amount of fees that was being received annually from the orphan clients. Yeah, the amount of fees that they, that they got from there was from a similar BIM report that was done at the time. And the incident, or the discovery date of the incident was said to be 7 May 2012? Yes. And... CBA understood in May 2012 that charging clients for services that, was not be that were not being delivered was unlawful? Let me yes. break it down. Yes. You understood in May of 2012 that charging clients for services that were not being delivered was unlawful? Yes. And as far as you were aware, everybody within CBA understood that? It's obvious, isn't it? Well... Yes, we would expect to deliver the services to our clients that, we, that they pay for. And do you say that at the time that this report was made in the Risk Insight database, that Count did not know enough to form the view that it was in breach of its obligation to act efficiently, honestly and fairly? Yes, it still needed to investigate the extent of the, the issue and the problem, because this data um, at 49 in my statement was off the back of a review so it was basically giving us data, but we still needed to determine 
uh, which clients were orphans. Deloitte issued a report in relation to count? Yes. Can we bring up CBA.0534.0001.0024? So this is a copy of the report. It's described as draft, but there was no final report ever provided. Yes. And it was treated by final. Count and CBA as the final report? Yes. All right. And then if we go to page 3.0026. We see the things that Deloitte were asked to do, which is under scope and objectives, compiling a comprehensive list of potential risks in count and the specific risk categories that had been identified by CBA Wealth Management Management over on the right hand side, the fourth of which is ongoing advice services. Yes. And if we go to page five of that document, dot zero zero two eight. There were a number of issues that were identified with respect to count. Yes. The first of which was sufficiency of governance, risk and compliance arrangements, which was rated very high. Yes. And then there's various other ones, but you'll see number seven, overcharging and undercharging of advice fees, which was rated high. Yes. And orphan client book, which was rated medium. Yes. And then if we go to page 14, which is dot zero zero three seven, You see what's set out there, on number eight, orphan client book. The finding was Count has an orphan client book, which as at September 2012, held approximately 10,200 policies, includes clients with multiple policies. Yes. This equates to annual fee income of approximately one and a half million dollars for all commissions received. Yes. And then You'll see at the bottom of the page it says, as reported to the Count Risk and Compliance Committee, when, and then over the page, an advisor leaves the licensee and does not take clients with them, and these clients do not respond to Count's attempt to contact them, they are transferred to Count Head Office. Yes. And then it's explained, without significant analysis and additional data being readily available, it is not possible to determine the portion of fee income related to advisor servicing fees versus trail commission or whether fees have been dialled up. It is understood that it is not common practice for count advisors to dial up fees and as such it is not expected that a significant proportion of the fee income received is in relation to ongoing advisor service fees. However, this assumption has not been confirmed. Yes. And then it explains that approximately three to four complaints are received annually in relation to the non-provision of ongoing services specifically related to orphan clients. Yep. And do you say on receiving this report you still did not understand that there was a problem with orphan clients at count? There was a, there was a problem. Um, if you could just go back two pages. Back two pages? Yeah, just the, the, where the first column of the... Um, the time that it took to, yeah, if you, um, if you just have a look at the second column there, which is uh, consider further investigation, uh, Deloitte identifies um, an issue there which in, uh, that they've actually called true orphans. So this data here was in relation to the fact that at this period of time in count, there were a number of advisors who had left and so the uh, head office account actually had more advisor, uh, more clients and advisor movement than it, than it ordinarily would have. That then, um, the section 912 notice that we actually do um, put in for that, you can see the, the jump in, in clients. So Deloitte was telling us that, and you know, we knew there was a problem, we needed to scope the problem and actually identify who the true orphans were in the book because at that time there were some advisors that were leaving count, there was a large number of advisors that had left. And so that um, head office account looked like there were more clients in there than, than there actually was, or that would, would stay with count. When we put the breach notice in, we then confirm the actual amount of clients and the fees that are paid uh, with, or, with the orphan clients. 
So that is just the work that needed to get done. So column one that you referred to scopes the actual potential problem, but Deloitte's are telling us to still investigate because of this, uh, this issue that we had uh, from that period of time, which was in September. Is it your understanding that until Count had figured out exactly how many clients it had taken money from without providing services that it did not need to provide a breach notification to ASIC? With the breach process, you do need to determine the significance. So at this time, um, we were still, yeah, we still wanted to put in the details in, in the breach notice. What we should have done at this time was actually switch off the fees and in hindsight, um, or, or when we actually went across and remediated, we did um, compensate for, for the clients. I tender that document, Commissioner. Exhibit 2.89, draft Deloitte report uh, concerning count business issues management, 20 November 2012, CBO 0534 0001 0024, Exhibit 2.89. Thank you, Commissioner. Now, on the 22nd of August 2014, so about 20 months after the receipt of that Deloitte report, Count purported to give an early warning notification to ASIC, is that yes. right? And then gave a breach notification on the 9th of September 2014? Yes. And do you say it was not until the 9th of September 2014 that Count understood that it had a systemic problem in relation to charging orphan clients fees and providing them with no services? The determination had happened um, at that point in time, but yes, it should have been done in a more timely manner. Well, let's just make sure we've understood this. Can we bring up exhibit MP-2 to Ms Perovic's statement number 22? The relevant document ID is CBA.0508.0008.0008. You see at the bottom of the page, one of the yes. things that the licensee is required to fill in is the date the licensee first became aware of the breach or likely breach. Yes. And count has put in August of 2014. Yes. Do you say that's true? So that is the day that it's determined to be a breach. Do you say it is true that the first day that or the first time at which Count became aware of the breach or likely breach was August of 2014. Well, when we, um, sorry, when we do the breach, we actually put in the breach notice within that period, but this is based on the breach reporting process um, so yes, the significance of the breach yeah, was determined at that time. I'm sorry, I just don't understand that. Yes, CBA's well, the, internal process, is that what sorry, you mean? Um, well, I was just saying, we've got, a trip, we've, got a, uh, we've got a breach reporting process and um, the breach that was identified, the date that is on that breach notice is the day that it would have gone ahead and been um, identified as a breach on the licence. By whom? We have a breach panel process, and uh, that is representatives within the business. Is that at the CBA level? No, uh, sorry, in the, in the advice business, which is count in, in the account business. Is there a common breach? Panel across the licensees. All right, so yes. it's a CBA panel, is that right? Across all of, lic all of the licensees? Yeah, so CBA advice wealth panel. And you say the only date you needed to put there was whatever date it finally reached up to that panel. Is that right? Well, the day that the that's actually the, um, yeah the date that the the breach panel decides that it is a significant breach. Can we go to paragraph eighty of Ms. Perovic's statement? Perkovic. I'm oh, sorry, Perkovic's statement. 
R2-2, uh, which is the document ID is CBA.9000.0007.0001. And go to page 0014, paragraph 80. You were asked some questions, or CBA was asked some questions by the Commission yes. about the reasons for the circumstances of fees for no service in relation to count. Yes. And you see your answer is, relevantly, the issue for count only related to circumstances where the customer did not transfer with their advisor when the advisor left count or nominate another advisor the issue did not relate to circumstances where the client had an active advisor but was not provided with the promised service. That's right. Count hasn't performed any investigation, has it, as to whether it has a systemic problem with its authorised representatives not providing services? It has. It has done sample testing. When did it do that? Uh, so recently, uh, so um, just go, uh, in 2014, off the back of the CFPL breach notice, uh, we had a look at um, to see if the other licensees had some uh, issues, and uh, there was sample testing done with Count and also other licensee. At the same time, ASIC had actually asked us and requested uh, that, and so both Financial Wisdom and um, and Count have had. Uh, sample testing to test whether the uh, ongoing services are being provided. Does the sample testing mean that some advisors were selected and audited? Yes. So it's about 800 files across the two licensees. Were audited in order to, dis to determine what percentage actually had ongoing services provided? Correct, yes. And do you know what percentage had ongoing services provided? Uh, that piece of work is currently still within the business that I... Um, uh, however, the fail rates um, for kind of both businesses are less than 2%. Can I show you CBA.0001.0075.7263? Yeah. So this is a document from the Count Risk and Compliance Forum in December of 2015. Yes. And how often does the Count Risk and Compliance Forum meet? Well, it's a management meeting, uh, so I'm not sure of the frequency. Do you attend it? No. Okay. Can we go to page 7277? Now, you're familiar with this type of document, I take it? It's not the format that it comes to us up at the for risk forum. I see. You understand what it's doing, which is setting out the results of yes. QAA investigations into yep. various authorised representatives? Yep. Is this part of the regular reporting of the audit results? So I'm not familiar with the management process, but um, if there, this would be reviewed um, and then raised kind of as an issue if the team investigate and put that in as an issue. Is the team currently instructed to determine if there's an issue with ongoing services actually being provided? Oh, the team, um, as part of the normal uh, review quarterly or the review processes of files, they do look at two files. This was a specific piece of work 
that was done, if you're, oh, if you're referring to the sample testing that was done, that was a specific piece. But in the normal course of the quality audit assurance process, they would look at ongoing service files. All right. Well, you see, we'll just look at some of the advisors reported here. You see there's an advisor identified here who is given a low rating and it said had not conducted reviews for ongoing service clients. Yes. And there's an, that was identified in August of 2015 and the update in October 2015 was recommend warning letter as a priority oh. due to four instances and systemic issues identified. Yes. This, I take it, is not the type of thing that would be reported up to whatever the risk committee is that would decide whether a breach notice needed to be given to ASIC? The, uh, the process that we have is that there's, um, you'd have instances and depending on the issues and the, uh, and the issues that come up will actually then uh, come up to, to review. So the, the team here would review this. Um, they would uh, work with our line to risk management, which is um, outside of the business, make a determination if it needs to go um, up into the, into the breach panel process. We go to page 7281. See, this is a different advisor. The summary is ongoing services have not been provided to clients. One file client dies in 2007. Contact made with deceased wife in 2013, but no action taken. And the action plan is or at the bottom, based on the above, recommend a formal warning be provided. Yes. And then if we go to 7287. <coughs> is the report in relation to a different Advisor, you'll see advisor provided advice to a client in 2003 who passed away in January 2004. Advisor is aware that the client is dead, but the ASF, what's that? Advisor services fee. Continues to be charged. When asked, he said he didn't know what to do and he had tried to contact the public trustee and had not heard back. The action heading is, you see what's set out there, but number four depending on outcome possible warning to advisor. You see that? Yes. We go to 7290. This is the different advisor. Under the summary, the last three QAA reviews conducted have indicated that this advisor has provided no advice to any client. It was discovered that he was receiving ongoing service fees from clients. You see that? Yes. And this is another one of the advisor receiving an ongoing service fee for a client who passed away? Yes. He has provided no advice to the client nor her estate and does not have an OGC agreement with her estate? Yes. And at least on this version, it doesn't even appear that there's a discussion about a warning to the advisor? I think uh, the document that you have, as I understand how the team use it more as a management reporting, so they would be updating it. They it might, be the warning it might come later, yeah. is that what you're saying? Yeah. And then if we go to 7293. This is a different advisor again, QAA identified numerous instances where advisor service fees are being received on behalf of multiple clients, but there is no evidence of ongoing services having been provided. Yes. The action plan you see over to the side, the third item, advisor to consider the need to continue ongoing service agreements for all clients. Yes. So this is the document from one forum how many advisors within the count network would need to not be providing ongoing services before it would be considered a systemic issue? 
it would need to be determined as a, through the significant breach panel. And have I understood your evidence to be that sometime, some years ago, a decision was made in response to a request from ASIC to begin analysing whether or not COUNT had a systemic problem? Yes, through, through, uh, through the sample review files. And did I also understand your evidence to be that even now that work is ongoing? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with where the team is up to with, uh, with respect to, uh, to discussions with ASIC, but they, they do provide updates with, uh, to ASIC. Attend to that document, Commissioner. Exhibit 2.90, Count Risk and Compliance uh, Forum, December 15, CBA 0001 I want to move to another topic, Ms Perovic. Perkovic. Perkovic, I apologise again. You've explained in your first statement, 2-1, at paragraph 149, subparagraph D, and the document ID for that document is CBA.9000.0006.0001. Sorry, what paragraph? Paragraph 149, subparagraph D. It's on, pa on your page number, it should be page 24. It has 0024 at the top. Have you got that there? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, that's the start of 149 and then D is over the page in relation to 0025. And this is in relation to variable remuneration plan for Commonwealth financial planning advisors. Yes. Thank you. You explain that on the 1st of July 2013, CFPL introduced advise, an advisor variable remuneration plan. Yes. And under that plan, 30% of an advisor's variable remuneration is deferred until the end of the financial year. Yes. But it was only in 2015 that a KPI was included of sound risk management, which included ensuring delivery of ongoing services to all customers? Correct. And in your view, is one of the explanations for the problem with the failure of CFPL employees to deliver services that there was no financial incentive to do so until 2015? Ongoing service um, and revenue was always part of their KPIs, but this was where we actually just introduced um, and changed the REM to make it, uh, to actually Im improve and enhance the remuneration that um, we did have before. So this is strengthening it, yes. Do you accept that one of the problems that Commonwealth Financial Planning had was that its remuneration and performance targets were not aligned so as to ensure delivery of service? Yes. All right. And that was an issue identified by an external audit by PwC in 2014? Uh, it was in 2014, correct, and it was one of the key issues um, that we did with off the back of the enforceable undertaking and implementation plan was to actually look at the remuneration and then improve it as we were going through. Now in your statement you explain some of the steps that CBA took in responding to the FOFA legislation in 2013. Yes. Can we go to page 0012? I want to understand 
CFPL's attitude to disclosing its fees to its clients as at 2013. The FOFA legislation took effect on the 1st of July 2013? Yes. And you explained that in November of 2013, Commonwealth Financial Planning commenced issuing fee disclosure statements to ongoing service customers? Yes. Why did it not start doing that until November of 2013? We were still um, building the systems at the time. And at the time, as at 1 July 2013, the effect of the legislation was that a fee disclosure statement needed to be given to every client that was receiving ongoing services? Correct. And so as at November of 2013, <laughs> CFPL was planning to issue, in compliance with the legislation, fee disclosure statements to all of its ongoing service clients? Um, so we were... Um the fee disclosure statements were for new clients that we were putting on. The, in, our, in my paragraph from 81 to 83, actually just um, is there are periods of time when we did have um, a no action letter because as we were still building the systems and then there were changes with the legislation and so that was, that's actually why there's the different gaps in the different um, Now you're obfuscating Ms Perkovic. What Sorry. you explain is that in paragraph, in paragraph 80, that in November 2013, CFPL commenced issuing FDSs to ongoing service customers, including statements in relation to periods ending from 1 July 2013? Correct. And then on the 20th of December 2013, the government announced that it was going to make amendments to the FOFA requirements so that it wasn't necessary to issue FDSs to customers who entered into ongoing fee arrangements before 1 yes. July 2013? Yes. And three days later, Commonwealth Financial Planning's... The immediate step that Commonwealth Financial Planning took was to stop generating fee disclosure statements to customers who had entered into ongoing fee arrangements before 1 July 2013. Yes, we did. And is that does that reflect an attitude which is unless you are required by law to provide fee disclosure statements, CFPL will not do it. Yes. And then the Senate disallowed the regulation yes. that was to allow financial planners not to make disclosure to clients who had entered into fee disclosure statements before 1 July 2013. Yes. And then, and that was in November of 2015, but ASIC... In November of 2014. I'm sorry, November, November of 2014. Yes. 14. Thank you, yeah. Commissioner. But then ASIC allowed licensees from 20 November 2014 until 30 June 2015 yes. to not comply with the law? Yes. And CFPL took full advantage of that allowance and only in July of 2015 recommenced issuing fee disclosure statements to all pre-1 July 2013 customers. Is that right? We did. Um, we were still building the system at the time. so, we, so You that, must yes. have built the system already because you had already been issuing yes. fee disclosure statements we were, to we're, the post 1 July correct. 2013 okay. customers, hadn't you? Yes, we were improving the systems. Uh, it was actually, there were, there were components of the systems that were a bit manual. And so we did take advantage of um, this relief that allowed us to improve the fee disclosure statements, um, which now are in the business. <clears throat> Does Commonwealth Financial Planning Limited continue to receive commissions from clients who entered into commission arrangements before 1 July 2013? Yes. Has there been any consideration within Commonwealth Financial Planning Limited 
of dialing down those commissions to zero and only receiving fees where it provides services to customers? Sorry, can you just repeat yes. that? Yes, I'll break it up. Has yes. there been any consideration within Commonwealth Financial Planning Limited of dialing down those commissions to zero? No. Why not? Um, well, at the moment, um, the grandfathering arrangements allow us some uh, relief as fee-for-service in, uh, fees increase. What we're thinking of actually doing is looking at applying fee, uh, applying opt-in uh, to clients before 2013 as a way for clients to understand their fees uh, pre, because uh, at the moment with opt-in, that category of people uh, don't get um, don't get the opportunity to opt in. So one of the ways that we're trying to, uh, instead of your way, we've got an alternative solution, which is to have a look um, and consider opt in for pre 2013 clients. How long have you been considering that for? Uh, just having discussions in the business. I think it's a question of how long, not yeah. how, how long. Okay, sorry. Yeah. I was saying the last six months. But no action's been taken. We haven't made a decision, but we do think it's an opportunity for the industry and a way that the industry also um, could possibly deal with the conflicted remuneration that we know is still uh, not seen as positive in consumer groups. I want to ask you now very briefly about your statement in relation to platforms. Yes. You've answered a couple of questions in relation to platforms. Yes. If you're a employee of CFPL, is the only platform available to you onto which you can put a client a CBA affiliated platform? Correct. And is there any benchmarking produced for CFPL employees to show them how that CBA affiliated platform compares with other platforms in the market? Uh, so the, the research is actually held at the, um, at the research team and when an advisor um, do, will do product replacement, they would actually have the tools to see how that platform compares with products uh, that clients are putting into, that, that they're looking at, if a client actually comes to them with an existing product. So the client has a tool, the advisor has a tool to help them determine. Is the answer to my question no, there is not benchmarking produced for CFPL employees to show them how the CBA affiliated platform compares with other platforms in the market? Well, the answer is yes, because they would actually have this opportunity, yeah. I yes. understand. It, what you're saying is, if a client comes to a CFPL planner yes. and already has a product in mind, then it would be possible for the CFPL planner to access some information that would compare that product with the CBA affiliated correct. product. That's correct. But in the ordinary course, a CFPL planner is not provided with information that would enable them to know how the, C the CBA affiliated platform compares with any other platform? Uh, not frequently, but it will happen from time to time. How? How does it happen? Uh, they would have updates um, either at their professional development days, uh, forums within their own teams, and um, also it is looked at in the research committee and are you aware of the CFPL planners ever having been told that the a CBA affiliated platform compares poorly with any other platform at any other price point? Uh, not, not escalated up through to me. You explain that in a statement of advice to a client, <coughs> the revenue sharing arrangements are disclosed to the client. Yes. Can I show you an example 
statement of advice. It's CBA.0001.0096.4213. Now this, you'll see, is a statement of advice prepared on 30 October 2014. Yes. I understand from your platform fees statement that the generic text in this version is still the generic text that you, is used in subsequent versions. Is that right? If you go to par paragraph 28 of your statement 2-24, yes. You'll see you say in the years 2014 to 2018, the CFPL statement of advice contained the following generic information or similar text in relation to investment platforms. Yes. And the statement of advice, by my reckoning, is 29 pages long and then has another ten or so pages of various fact files attached to it. Yes, they're very long documents. And then if we go to page 4237. Should be page 25 of 29. So this is disclosing on the 25th page of the statement the revenue sharing arrangements that apply to CFPL. Yes. And I just want to understand what it is that is being disclosed here. which is that CFPL has revenue sharing arrangements with product providers on the approved product list? Yes. Would those revenue sharing arrangements only be if they're under a grandfathered arrangement? Yes, this would be a grandfathered arrangement. And is one of the things that CFPL is continuing to do to rely upon the fact that there were grandfathering arrangements entered into pre-1 July 2013 that would also apply to new funds invested after 1 July 2013. Yeah, well, it We'll have to take that on notice. No, no, no. Yeah. Nothing can Sorry. be taken on notice, I'm afraid. Let's yeah. break it down. This is a disclosure oh, being given yeah. in October of 2014, yes. where it said up to 0.10% of funds invested into the colonial first state first choice wholesale product, and it's explained that is also an associated, associated entity, may be paid to Commonwealth Financial Planning Limited. You see that? Yes. And isn't it the case that the position that CFPL has taken is that if it had a grandfathered arrangement in place before 1 July 2013, that arrangement can also apply to new monies invested after 1 July 2013? Well, it shouldn't be, so I'm not sure why, why, this, why this is in the SOA. You're saying it, so it's not the case? Yeah, well, grandfathered, grandfathered arrangements um, that we that we had. Um, yeah, I'm just not across the actual specific detail of this. 
You describe in your statement mm. that we were just looking at, or I'm sorry that we, you and I have looked at, it hasn't come up on the screen, yeah. the fact that there are revenue sharing arrangements after 2014. I apologise, I can't answer that question now. Do you not know? I'm sorry, I withdraw that. Let me break this down. Can we go to page, can we go to, do, I'm sorry, attend to that document, Commissioner. Statement of advice, uh, 30 October 2014, CDA 0001009642134213 will be exhibit 2.91. Can we go to Ms. Perkovic's statement dated the 5th of April 2018 in response to 2 24? That is CBA.9000.0009.0001. If we go to paragraph 28, CBA.9000.0009.0008. This is where you're explaining statements yes. of advice and yes. you say in the years 2014 to 2018, the CFPL statement of advice contained the following generic information in relation to investment platforms, and yes. then you set it out. And then you say those statements of advice reference the APL process and disclose revenue sharing arrangements in place with recommended platform providers, including the entities. Please. Yes. Can we bring up that document? CBA 0001009642134237. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We go to page 25.4237. Perkovic. Yes. Do you know whether CFPL is continuing to receive commission under for new investment under arrangements entered into before 1 July 2013? For arrangements before 2013, yes. 
even if it's new investment after 1 July 2013 by clients. I just need to check if this is an existing client. Could I just have a look at the SOA, please, the first few pages of the SOA? Yes, I can provide yeah, you with a hard sorry. copy. Thank you. So what the witness has is a hard copy of the document on the screen, is that yes. right? But unredacted. Unredacted, very well. I'm sorry, just for the information that's been provided, I just need to take a bit more time to have a look at it. What are you trying to figure out, Ms oh. Perkovic? Are you trying to figure out whether it's possible that it might be said that this was an existing client pre-1 July yes. 2013, yes. and therefore it would be possible to continue to take a percentage of the, from correct. them? Yeah. I see. Which it doesn't appear. It doesn't appear is. that they are a client that was pre-1 July 2013, does it? No. It appears that they are a new client after 1 July 2013. Correct, yeah. And that what is being said to them is that there is a revenue sharing arrangement between the platform and CFPL that would enable up to 0.10% of funds invested to be paid over. Yes. And they're both CBA entities. Yes. Now, I want to move to one last topic, Ms Perkovic, and that is the enforceable undertaking that was entered into last week by CFPL and BW Financial Lim Advice Limited. Yes. And are you familiar with that enforceable undertaking? I am. I did say it as part of being on the board. Were you involved in its negotiation? No. Do you know how long it was negotiated for? Uh, from the original letter that was received by ASIC, I believe that was from February 2017. So for over a year. Is that right? Yes. And during that period of time was one of the things that CFPL and BWFA were trying to do to limit the amount of money that had to be paid under the enforceable undertaking? I wasn't involved in the negotiations. Are you aware? Well, you're on the board and there was reporting back to you, wasn't there? Yeah, at a board level when the decision's made final, but not, not the negotiations of... You're saying there was no reporting back to the board as to the negotiations in relation oh, to the we were getting updates. But as All to, right. yes. Were you being updated that CFPL was trying to limit the, and BWFA were trying to limit the amount of money that had to be paid to the community benefit fund under the enforceable undertaking? I wasn't aware of that. I wasn't involved in those negotiations. Were you given? We were given an update when the payment. Was agreed? Was agreed. Were there instructions given by the board as to how much money CFPL and BWFA were prepared to pay to the community benefit fund? No. It was just left entirely in the hands of other people to decide? Uh, no. At that time, um, the group executive of Wealth worked with, it worked with the um, executive general manager in the business now. Are you aware of CFPL and BWFA resisting the attestations that were required by ASIC under the enforceable undertaking? 
I'm aware that there were discussions between them. When you say you're aware resisting. that there were discussions... No, I'm not aware that they were resisting. I'm aware that they were clarifying how it will apply and to who it would apply because how the entities actually have um, kind of a general manager running the business and then that, that goes up into an executive general manager. So the discussions were at what level, the, at, at what level they would apply. And can we bring up the enforceable undertaking? Oh, thank you. Can we go to page four of that document? So this sets out the various concerns that ASIC had. Yes. And then if we go over the page, this is the acknowledgement of ASIC's concerns by CFPL. Yes. Which appears to be limited to CFPL acknowledges that the concerns expressed by ASIC are reasonably held. Yes. Just so I can understand, does CFPL also acknowledge that not only were the concerns reasonably held, but they reflect an accurate view of the failures by CFPL to comply with the law? Yes. And Count hasn't yet entered into an enforceable undertaking? No. I don't have any further questions for this Thank witness you, Mr. commission. Hodge. Does any party other than CBA seek leave to examine Ms. Perkovic? Very well. Yes. Uh, no, thank you. No. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Perkovic. You may step down. You are excused. Now, uh, Mr. Hodge. Commissioner, that concludes case studies one and two. There are some documents that I need to tender. for some other entities in respect of which the Commission obtained statements. We have not included them as part of the oral examination of the case studies. Can I tender the following? In relation to ANZ, a statement of Darren Williams dated the 13th of April 2018. The document ID is ANZ.99.007.0001. Statement of Darren Williams, 13 April 18, ANZ 99007001 will be exhibit 2.92. Thank you. And then a statement of Adrian Qua dated the 10th of April 2018, also with respect to ANZ. The document ID is ANZ.99.004.0001. Sorry, what date is Mr Qua? I'm sorry, dated the 10th of April 2018. That statement with that doc ID will be 2.93. And an additional statement from AMP in relation to fees for no service of Sarah Caroline Britt, B-R-I-T-T, -T, dated the 10th of April 2018. The doc ID is AMP.6000.0063.3063. That statement will be Exhibit 2.94. Thank you. And then in relation to Case Study 2, platform fees, the issue of platform fees was also raised with two additional institutions, ANZ and Macquarie. And I tender the statement of Mark Pankhurst, P-A-N-K-H-U-R-S-T, dated the 13th of April 2018 from ANZ. The doc ID is ANZ.99.00. 008.0001. It will be Exhibit 2.95. And there are two statements from witnesses from Macquarie. The first is a statement of Cameron Garrett, dated the 14th of April 2018, with document ID MGL.0017.0002.0001.
will be Exhibit 2.96. And the last statement is a statement of Michelle Weber, dated the 16th of April 2018, Doc ID MGL.0006.0003.0001. That will be Exhibit 2.97. Thank you, Commissioner. Could we adjourn for a few minutes while Council rearrange? Yes, if I come back at, uh, say, 10 to 11. Thank you.